would like to call tonight's Planning Commission meeting to order. Uh, I will start with an approval of the agenda. Uh, actually, yeah, we're good. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition? All right, seeing none, the, approval, the agenda is approved. Item three, approval of the minutes from March 8th, 2022 with an asterisk. I so move. Can I move? No, no. I want to move to approve this, and I want to talk about it. Well, move motion and a second, then we can talk, right? Okay. Uh, motion and a second? Yes. All right. So what we have been provided at our last minutes. So until for, the, for the record, uh, Mr. Dana made the motion, and uh, Ms. Liz oh, sure. made the second. Yeah. Because I realized we ended up. Yeah. I was just joking. Let's go for it. Um, so, um, we were at first provided just like basically um, a, a minute by minute of the votes. Um, we were not actually provided a transcript of, um, or we were not provided minutes, nor we were, were we provided the transcript um, that was then available um, later today. So, I'm moving to approve the minutes because I actually read them. I read through the transcript. Um, and I'm ready to say that except for some minor uh, transcription errors, that it was correct. The only thing I want to say about it, though, is that, like, that's not minutes. And I understand you were saying, like, this is a city council um, directive to use this software. But I just want to put out there that it would be very difficult for the public later on to to come back and like research some of these cases or or understand what what fully happened because there's just so much noise with the transcript there's just so much there so i just wanted to put that comment into the record and i want to say i can't speak for the approval because i have no idea what the minutes say so one of the things that um be because of the length of time that goes into preparing minutes it's days of work. Um, well, council moved forward with action minutes on the assumption that, that you could go and look at the recording since we have a direct recording. Um, it's, it's, it's difficult when all you have is a list and then a recording in a separate place. I know that Heather's been working with council to try to provide links to portions of, so at least if you click on an agenda item, you can go. Is it possible? And I don't know how much work is involved in that because that way, at least if you see like, this is an agenda item about Al Brand, you can click on it and it brings you that portion of the video so that you, you don't need to scroll back through the meet, you know, and, and, and I think that's the, the thought is that the video is, is the direct recording of our, of our um, meetings. At least is there a hybrid way that we can, I know well, that the but I would are, argue those aren't minutes. The transcription is not a, a <clears throat> minutes. Minutes so take to quote a lot. Robert's rules, they are not transcripts of the proceedings. Right. So, so even though I am voting to, or I am moving to approve, or seconding a motion to approve the minutes, I'm doing that because I read a transcript. I did not read minutes. So, um, and and I totally get it that it takes days and days to prepare proper minutes. And I do understand why there would be, you know, a lot of reason to choose software that, that does it this way. Um, I just, we also didn't have it available to no. us until 3.30 p.m. So. Maybe a third rail is we use the transcript and we can write down two minutes. That's also an option because then it is easier to read. It is a synopsis as opposed to a direct transcript, but then it also is less labor intensive for staff. Well, I, and I think the city council and staff are trying to work through what's a workable model. I mean, we went from super resource intensive minutes to this, which is kind of on the other end of the spectrum. And, and I think that we and council were trying to find a way that somewhere in the middle, but I, so I think it's to be continued because we're trying to find a less resource intensive way and really critical way to do it. And the reflection is not on the community development staff. Not at it's, all, no. It's, it's on it's the contrary. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so we've had discussion. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor of approving the minutes say aye. 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 Any opposition? Yes. Nay. So two, two against. All right. Uh, moving on. Public comments related to items not on the agenda. So if there's anyone in the crowd who would like to uh, share their thoughts or comments with the Planning Commission, feel free to come up to the podium. Uh, again, these are for items not on tonight's agenda. 
let the record reflect that nobody in the crowd moved. And we will move on to business item number five, reports from commissions, boards, committees, and staff. We will start with Dr. Privilege. So I guess I'll just report on um, the Climate Action Steering Committee, which has been working to develop an outline of the Climate Action Plan, which is part of our commitment to carbon neutrality through the um, Global Covenant of Mayors. So the, the Steering Committee met looking at uh, models from other places. It's really kind of an outline of goals and objectives um, that we shared uh, with MKSK as part of the um, comprehensive planning process. But I think that some of those things that deal with planning, we have to think about how we're gonna relate to this board because there are some goals related to planning. And, and I think right now there's high level goals and objectives, but I think it would be really good discussion of boards that that's their domain to, to, to figure out how would we implement that. So that's just kind of an idea. Thanks, sir. Mr. Brack. Uh, the Environmental Commission uh, sent on some recommendations to council around uh, pollinator friendly uh, lawns and other areas, um, public areas as well. And that's gonna be discussed at the work session coming up. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Rosenberg? Um, Housing Advisory Commission did not meet last week, uh, last month. All right. I had an early nod. Mr. Dana. I can say that the <coughs> Economic Development Committee and Commission itself I cannot report on, but what I can report on is the activity of the, of the executive director, Seth Krappenbaker, who has been, in my judgment, is innovating and in sponsoring economic development initiatives. So Mr. Koppen, Mr. Koppenbaker is going forward with economic development agendas on behalf of the city. I want that simply to be a, a matter of correction. If you would like, I can point to Mr. Koppenbaker <laughs> there, and we're glad he's with us. That's all my report. Thank you, sir. Uh, historic architecture uh, does not have a meeting tomorrow, but uh, I, I think it's of note uh, the large building across the way that is uh, starting to take noticeable form. Um, that's something that the, the city staff and the HFPC have worked really hard uh, with, uh, well, with a lot of folks, and uh, it's just nice to see that coming to fruition, uh, considering it was a grass lot for however many years. Um, do there is one thing and, and if uh, Mr. Perry could elaborate a little bit more there are some opportunities from both a historic uh, uh, history and an architectural standpoint uh, conferences um, for some of our folks uh, at the city level um, uh, Mr. Perry has uh, been very inclusive of the commission members uh, those are coming up in July mm -hmm. um, so I don't have the details in front of me so I will actually defer the rest of my HAPC and just streamline it Thank you. Yeah, um, and I'll add to that, uh, Mr. Chair. There's a the National uh, Association of Alliance for Preservation Commissions is going to be in Cincinnati this year, which is really nice. Uh, it's only every two years. It's called the Forum, and it's a organization that is designed specifically to assist uh, volunteer boards that are focused on historic preservation. And being in Cincinnati makes a great opportunity for uh, preservation boards around the area to uh, partner with other preservation boards and learn how they run their commissions and boards uh, and so several of us I think are going to be able to attend it's in uh, July 17th through 20th uh, downtown Cincinnati and there'll be some walking tours and seminars that takes place over a three-day period so uh, myself and uh, I think Zach is also going to be attending part of it and a couple a couple commission members so we're excited to have that nearby in our backyard uh, Mr. Moore, Mr. Perry, anything else you'd like to report? Yeah, just a very short update on the uh, Oxford Tomorrow comprehensive plan. So um, it's been a little while, but we did have our visioning workshop on April 18th, which uh, many of you did attend, and uh, that uh, turned out to be a great event. We had 102 total participants at that, uh, so heard from a lot of different folks, a lot of great feedback at that event. Um, and also thank you to OBF once again for hosting um, that event, allowing us to use their, their venue. Um, so yeah, just uh, stay tuned for some future updates. You can always visit our project website. It's oxfordtomorrow.org. Um, we don't have our next event scheduled as of yet, but if I had to take a wild guess, it'd probably be sometime June, I would guess. Um, but as soon as those dates are arrived at, um, there will be some notifications that go out via email. Thank you. All right, <clears throat> moving on to new, new business. 
PC 2022-1. Uh, it's a major amendment for, to the 2009 conditional use of 5302 University Park Boulevard uh, for Talawanda City Schools. And I'm not sure who's going to come up and speak on their behalf, so I will um, accept a motion to adjourn to public hearing. I so move. Second. Mr. Dana with the win, Dr. Gerfuch with the second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, Mr. Perry, you have the floor. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. So at the March meeting was a discussion about a possible uh, minor amendment for this project, and this has come back as a full conditional use application in the form of a major amendment to the 2009 conditional use. We wanted to make sure for the public's benefit that we had that in there, that it's still an amendment to the previous approval for the for the school so this is a bus garage and maintenance facility that's intended to be for the Talawanda City School District and this will support the overall school district but be located at the high school property the overall high school property uh, is 155 acres so it's a large property uh, this this has been designed by Bear Becker Sean Topelski uh, is here tonight as well on behalf of school so you're probably familiar with uh, this overall project and because we looked at this in uh, sufficient detail in March I won't go through uh, quite as much but I will go through it in the sense of there are decision criteria that are more detailed than a minor amendment because this would be considered a major amendment which takes a recommendation to City Council to make an amendment to the 2009 conditional use. Anytime there is a school, a drive-through restaurant, any type of uh, use that could have, that could need some special considerations to make sure that it fits within the area and does not have any impacts on the surrounding area, the conditional use process is for that. It's for the public's benefit, I wanted to uh, share that. So the, the map there on the screen uh, shows the, the location of the bus garage where coming off of 27, into University Park Boulevard, which is a public roadway, and then that turns into private property and into the driveway of the high school. And the bus garage, which is a relocated facility, is the proposal from the current location on Chestnut Street, which is being referred to as Chestnut Fields, the Miami parking lot that's nearby there. That area will be redeveloped into an intermodal station uh, for Butler County Regional Transit. And so the, the bus facility and storage is there now needs to find a new home. So that is what this uh, project is about. This next slide shows the zoning and you can see uh, the area, subject area is R1A, which is actually not an uncommon district for a school to be in. So that's the low density, single family residential. You can also see some of the surrounding uh, properties. The aviary, which was Indian Trace Apartments, previously known as, and then the OI, or Office Industrial District, which is where the Kettering uh, Medical Facility now, you can see that's built, which does not show up on the aerial photo here. And while I've got this screen here, you, can, you may recall that there was uh, an outreach made by the school to the property owner of the apartment complex there, the aviary, to actually hold a uh, listening session if there was interest. And it turns out that there was no attendance, but the effort was made. This is a site plan that's in your packet. Uh, what's not in the packet here is what's on the screen where it's overlaid on the aerial photo. You can see it in context here. It's actually the same footprint that was presented in March. But as I said before, this is the, uh, the full process uh, going through this recommendation to city council. There have been some minor changes that were made based on the feedback. So that process did help, even though uh, it was essentially a denial of it being acceptable as a minor amendment those comments that were provided were folded into the design for the major amendment, which you have in front of you tonight. Um, this slide that zoomed up on a little bit closer, so you can see the detention basin uh, that's to the, to the east or on the right. You can see there are two driveways, the in uh, and the out. And you can see there's two parking lots because it's designed to have uh, staff and employee parking that is outside the secure area, and then buses which would be inside the secure area. And while I've got the screen here, uh, you may recall there was discussion about uh, the impacts of potentially noise, lighting, maybe even fumes, some discussion about uh, what those impacts might be, 
how that could be mitigated uh, in regards to the, the idling or the storage of the buses. Which brings me to the next slide, and there's additional landscaping that's been added which was not on the plans. And also there was privacy slat screening added to what was already proposed to be a chain link fence. So there's a couple different additional layers of uh, mitigation there. It wouldn't be 100% mitigation because there would be some noise, even though it's not in a neighborhood. Uh, but this would help have some effect on lessening that. And that's in addition to the vegetation that is intended to remain along the property lines, both on the north and the east. The easement uh, was discussed as well. Uh, there's an existing roadway easement that was actually approved by city council already earlier this year uh, to be removed and replaced with, an, with a new easement location which would accomplish the same purpose in the spirit of the long range transportation plan. The one that's shown here overlaying uh, this, this site plan was recommended and approved to be relocated with the notion that the new bus garage facility would conflict with that. And so in order to maintain the same intent for potential connectivity in the future, even though it may be it's not planned, it's not budgeted, there's, no, there's nothing in the capital improvement plan or any state or federal funding, it is in the public interest to make sure that there is a potential connection there in the future. And then this next slide does show where that connection could be. It's actually a little bit shorter and would connect to the north, which could potentially provide a better, more feasible connection uh, to the west uh, across the river tracks if this property were to be ever developed. The property to the west does have a conservation easement on it, so connecting uh, through that property would be unlikely. So while we're not discussing the merits of the easement itself tonight, since that decision has already been made, uh, we wanted to make sure that you were aware that that was something uh, that was <coughs> part of the overall project. This was a slide that was used with the city council discussion that shows the overall uh, plan. Some of the elements here uh, don't actually align with the reality because of, at the time they were drawn, the school wasn't there, so it just shows you the outdated nature of the long range transportation plan. But the point A to point B from getting from the one side of the river tracks to the other, this, this easement would accomplish that. So uh, with that in mind, um, I don't wanna go through and read the staff report, um, but I, I can answer questions. I can go back through some of the discussion points that you had at the time. I think the main ones had to do with mitigating the any potential fumes um, and lighting any noise of the of the area and I think also it's just the fact that uh, staff's analysis of this was that this could be done as a minor because of the overall scope compared to the overall site at the bus garage even though it is a large development 7500 square foot building parking at 40 buses a half dozen staff staff felt like that was within the scope of the overall high school site uh, based on the discussion that you all had in March that was not your finding and we were fine with that so um, that's the main reason why we're back here tonight so uh, we do have some conditions uh, that are in the spirit of the plans and the waivers that we recommend the roadway easement being one that needs to be recorded the building permit has not actually been submitted yet so there's there is no reason uh, to um, to have that as a as an issue, but before it is issued, that is something that administratively we need to accomplish. As far as parking lot curbing, you may recall if you're familiar with the high school site, there there is not any parking lot curbing uh, because of the original design. Our recommendation was to include that, so that has been done on portions of the site, not the entire site, at least in the areas where there could be some turning radius, uh, the vehicles where they, people could possibly leave the drives in the parking, we wanted to make sure that there could be some uh, prevention of that, uh, so they have agreed to that, but it would still be a waiver on portions of the parking area. Parking lot islands uh, was another one as well, that is not also not a feature of the uh, existing high school site. There is significant trees and landscaping uh, already existing and proposed to be new that would help to compensate for that uh, and there is the, the
the issue of the height of the buses would have some potential conflicting with landscape trees that could be in those parking lot highways. And because of the preservation of the vegetation along the property lines that are actually outside the construction area, our recommendation is to waive the tree survey requirement uh, with the condition that the trees that are shown on the plan uh, would be planted. And that is our recommendation to uh, pass that on as a uh, recommendation for approval of city council. Happy to answer any questions or go back to any of the site plans uh, if you'd like. Basically, it says the site is designed so that on site traffic and traffic access accessing the site will not be appropriately impact movement of traffic, so on and so forth. And uh, I've read your response. Um, my concern is not this per se, but a, a correlation would be we've had these criteria about traffic um, in uh, properties that have. It says here if basically if things aren't kept on the up and up that it can be revoked. It's a little easier to, to deactivate permission for a drive through on a former bank and ice cream shop than it is a 7,500 square foot multi million dollar facility. What kind of oversight or, or discussions are anticipated? Because that was a concern that came up at the March meeting is yes, yeah, certain times and fairly school centric there but as we know with Kettering and the existing uh, apartment building there's a lot more traffic and it's zoned for people that aren't in school so how can we enforce that or what's the reality and feasibility because I'm a little uncomfortable with a eh, if it doesn't work out we'll revoke it this is a little different than a drive through yeah that, that's a that's a good catch the word revoke is pretty strong there and what we have talked to with the drive through restaurants about is requiring adding staffing uh, to actually have staff to increase the speed or have traffic control and management out in the public right-of-way because those are public safety issues. With the length of University Park Boulevard, that does provide some mitigating effect. Uh, there was a determination by the city engineer that there was not a traffic impact analysis needed. However, things do happen and things do change. There could be potentially reprogramming of the signal there could be right-of-way improvements made to help with uh, stacking and queuing and loading, additional staffing added. So the likelihood of the city actually revoking and preventing the usage of the bus maintenance facility is extremely low. It's more like there would be uh, requirements that the school staff would provide some mitigation to lessen the impact on public safety at the signal. And this could, so not thinking of the signal at 27, but um, the easement was taken north for future development potentially, and um, in the lower corner, that's a parcel, if I'm not mistaken, that's not owned by the school. So with how they're zoned, if those are developed, what responsibility does the district have for 10 years down the road? the words University Park Boulevard that if I'm not mistaken is not their parcel that's correct and above it is not there so if in 10 years two complexes come in the aviary two three and five what what's the impact or uh, relevance to uh, decision, decision criteria K? my understanding is it's kind of first come first serve so if the development that's already there now uh, the, so the new developer of the vacant property would have to take into consideration what is already there and the city engineer would have to determine if the new development has additional impacts that cannot be mitigated by the development or additional improvements in the right of way so additional signals turn lanes those kinds of things so the responsibility would not fall back on the school it would be on the new development Mr. Perry. Um, oh, Mr. 
Kowalski, Liz Reed. I'm not sure who's who's coming up this week. Well, I'll invite you both. Hi, I'm Shauna Tafelski. Thank you for having me again uh, tonight. Um, Sam did a phenomenal job. So the only thing I can reiterate is that uh, we took your concerns and uh, brought them back and um, and implemented the additional trees uh, for the um, for the aesthetics, the sound, the noise pollution, etc. So, like I said before, we are willing to do whatever needed to get this project moving and started. So we will be kicked out soon and a new place for our buses and maintenance to go. So if you have any questions, let us know. Thank you. Anyone have any questions? So can I ask a question? And this is, it just happened that by looking at the topographical map, which has a pretty high re uh, resolution, there is a mounded feature at the center of the site. And do you know if that's likely from the construction activities of the high school. It's just, I, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an anomalously like a mound of something. You talking on the northern side? Yeah, on the northern side. And so I don't know whether there's any origins that you know of from the construction of the high school, which perhaps oil I was put there. Do not. I mean, that was before your time. I just, we live in a part of the world where you see mounds. Uh, yeah, you know, so I just, well, I would love to. Discussion within 500 yards of that um, a report of a Native American burial mounds. So that's a good question. So it's our under, it's our understanding as to it's remnant leftover material from the build the construction of the school, okay. and we will be grading into that with the construction of this compound. Okay. So I guess yeah, just as a if 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 someone who was around in the construction of the school would know could confirm that it would alleviate any concerns that there was something historical there. I just want to make sure, and I'm, I think this has been discussed, so I'm a little bit beyond this, but it's, it's number I in, in the criteria. And it speaks of the development of the site and operation of the use will not require substantial public expenditure for additional infrastructure services, and speaks of the approved relocation of a road easement for a future crosstown, crosstown roadway, which is viewed as a, quote, good thing. It's a beneficial, beneficial is, is, is what I'm suggesting, or rather what I'm questioning, and I just want to know if there's any remarks pertinent to make on whether this is just a good thing and we should go forward without any comment or observation. I'm not sure. I guess the staff analyzed that. Yeah, I, I think that might be question for Mr. Berry or Mr. Moore about this. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the, our belief is that the, the easement that is being relocated that council has approved maintains the intent of the Crosstown Roadway from one side of the railroad tracks to the other. And so this, this project created the need to make sure that it's maintained. Right. Okay. Thank Does that you. help yeah. with that was what I was seeking. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. I don't see any other questions. Thank you. Thank you. All right. At this time, uh, we will entertain any comments um, from members of the public related to this matter on the agenda. And uh, if you'd like to offer your perspective um, and share with the commission, we have to hear what you have to say. Hello, and thank you, I'm Seth Krogmaker. Thanks, Steve, for the introduction earlier. Um, and just taking a quick second to say, um, you know, kind of growing into this role of economic development and uh, really looking to, to add a voice to these conversations, um, supporting development. Um, not supporting developers, not supporting any specific project, but supporting opportunity for the city of Oxford. So that's really hope what you know, I'll be able to, to advocate for. Uh, I think this is a good project uh, for the city of Oxford. Um, certainly, you know, on, on its face, it doesn't, um, on the surface, show a lot of economic development opportunity. Uh, but I think indirectly, it provides quite a bit. Uh, the relocation of the busing uh, garage services, 
all those busing operations away from that Chestnut Fields site, which has to be done in order to move forward on some very significant multimodal projects, um, is, is a real windfall for our community. Um, I think beyond that, uh, Steve brought up the, this idea of kind of a, across, um, across the city, uh, movement, transportation. I do think that uh, moving in this facility, again, opens up a major east-west corridor along that southern edge of the, uh, the Miles Square, so it could really help kind of that cross-town traffic uh, in an area that may see significantly more traffic as um, you know, uh, Butler County Regional Transit, Depot, and, and Amtrak and things like that get developed. So um, certainly from an economic development standpoint, the CIC would support this project as, as something that would help Oxford move forward. So thank you. Second. Remain on with the second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposition? Seeing none, we are out of public session. We have discussion requests. So I guess I would, the, the conditional use is something that is, is generally permit, if it's listed as a conditional use, and schools are listed as a conditional use in this zone, um, and I think by schools in the 21st century, that includes transportation facilities as integral to the zone use. This includes um, football fields and parking lots and um, FFA greenhouses. So it's, it's a part of a school and uh, schools are permitted uh, as a conditional use. So then the question becomes, does this modification create negative consequences that uh, either can be mitigated or can't be mitigated? And if they can be mitigated, then it's kind of incumbent on us to uh, approve it. Um, whether or not we like it or not, it's more just like, and so to me, I think we discussed the negative consequences in terms of the lighting, um, the potential noise, um, things like that. And it seems to me that all the potential concerns that we raised or that would be raised about something like this are addressed by the design features. Um, so it, it, so it, it's, uh, and, and I think that I would appreciate there was an outreach to the neighbors who would be most likely impacted by buses idling at, at 4 or 5.30 in the morning. Um, the fact that there wasn't really concern. So I, I think it's good. I mean, this is why conditional use has come before planning commissions because this is an impact. Um, but I just think it's that the schools kind of in support of this as designed. And I really appreciate the additional investment in the screening and the slats. And, that will address a lot of the issues and, and maybe hopefully in 10 years the buses will be electric and they won't make as much noise and so uh that's my piece on that one yeah I, well, I normally reserve my comments to the end but one that i do want to point out and i do want this i, I have a comment to something dr perkridge said and i do want this reflected in the minutes uh, i commend the district for reaching out to the property owner but i want to make sure people understand it was to the property owner and it's a complete rental apartment and for compliance they, they hypothetically i have no idea what was done but they could have posted something on a community bulletin board that nobody knew about so i don't want to put too much credence to the fact that there was no feedback because as renters they have no stake and and if anything we've learned living in oxford a college town the owner of the property and the people who reside there are worlds apart many a time so that was the only thing i wanted to timely interject I think that's an excellent point, but I, I want to simply come forward in supporting what Dr. Pepper just said, and it's a very simple formula. There's a, it can, it's our obligation to look at it. It can be mitigated, and it's in the public interest, and it should be supported. That was, I think, what you said. Steve Orr. I'm probably, probably the only one. I'm voting no on this request. Well, it may be school related, it's a commercial industrial use and clearly does not meet the city's code for conditional use in a residential zone. If I looked at Hamilton, the middle zone, Dakota, Musgrove is not co-located with the school. So this is somewhat unusual, even though it was located as far as I want it for years. But it was over there at the edge where the city garage is and the township garage, et cetera. And given the size of the, uh, uh, 
given the size of the property, I might have been willing to accept that they located the garage on the southeast corner of the property. Beyond the cell tower adjacent to land zone office light industrial rather than located next to two big properties zoned residential. And lastly, I got to say it's kind of a protest thing. When I was serving on council in exchange for the city giving up its claim to the reverted Chestnut Street school property, we negotiated right away through the area and now requested for the bus garage. I disagree strongly that the replacement is anywhere near as good as the other one was. The other one maybe couldn't have gone across the railroad right there, but you had a uh, university parkway, beautiful sweeping turn that could have turned back toward the railroad or could have turned into the next property that the city were able to acquire. Whereas this thing's gonna, okay, it's gonna be a, a connector to, to a south southern city connector, but oh, this nice parkway all of a sudden stops. And you gotta have a traffic light and make a right turn to get into this other property. And looking at the maps, it's not as wide as the other negotiated right away was. So again, it's kind of a protest. You can't do anything about it because city council already took it away, but I don't think it was a good move. It's turning a beautiful University Parkway into a dead end with only a hard right angle intersection. And I strongly disagree with Sam who says it's similar. It ain't anywhere close to what that other right of way was in terms of a flowing connector. So that's it. I don't have much to say. Um, I'm just glad that it could come back to planning so quickly so that um, this could um, move forward because I'm really supportive of it. I just agreed that it wasn't a minor amendment last time. Mr. Norval. Um, so we didn't dig into it. CRTA, multimodal, and Amtrak, and just being, uh, I think it's fair to say, intimately familiar with those. Uh, I, I see this as contrary to the environmental direction the, or the city is going with elimination and consolidation. Uh, the RTA is going to have a larger footprint there. We're going to have platforms and other things, and now we're going to have two of them. being said, I still, and I do appreciate, I genuinely appreciate the district's mitigation efforts, but um, I, I actually would have to agree to an extent with Mr. Keebler in that if my reading of the map is correct, <laughs> the closest dwelling unit to that uh, aerial fuel tank is about 200 feet. And maybe I've watched too many movies, but that's their theory. That's the closest I've seen. It's one thing, and the sequencing is very important. When a residential dwelling is there and then we put the problem next to it is different than if the people on the north build a neighborhood and people choose to buy that. Um, I, I think the sequencing is critical for me. The, the folks in those apartments, and if you know about the demographics of some of those folks, I, I just don't know if that aligns completely with the ecological, the economic, or other factors the, the uh, city's trying to go for. So, um, kind of on the fence here, but I just, I wanted to make sure that was reflected in the minutes. I do agree with one thing you said. When, when the school board, the previous school board, decided to sell Tower 1, they definitely said they would be part of the intermodal and co-locate the buses and everything down school board's decided different. So I do want to point that out too. 
Well, and it's difficult with these things because there's the scope of what our conversation is, and then there's all the other history. And obviously, there's a lot of history around this stuff. Um, yeah, I, I, I wish that there were the efficiency to the combined facility, but those are not decisions. You know, that was the school board's decision. Um, one thing that I would say, since we're just talking about it, I think that this is just a request, and maybe you have one or maybe you don't, is that I can, I can imagine there will be continued development of this 150-acre parcel as part of school. And so to the degree that you develop a master plan for what will go where will help us, for example, in determining what's the best alignment to reserve in the future so that it's not part of a building site. So I, I think that it's likely over the future that, that that high school, as we see, it's not the only thing you're going to have out there. So the degree you have a master plan that, that can be coordinated with what the city's thoroughfare plan is, let's keep those conversations going because It'd be better to have the big picture and then fill in the pieces, mm -hmm. then fill in a piece and then regret where we put the piece. So um, course change and it'll do just the opposite, David, just like your council did versus what might not. <laughs> uh, you also said to the extent that we have a master plan. I mean, I caught that phrase as being rather significant. We don't really have one, do we? Well, I'm talking about the a master site there. plan for the school. Oh, okay. But okay. should there be consolidation of facilities here or something, then it would, it, you know, I think it's just going to be important because we have cell towers and we have, so maintaining, for example, that north-south right away and where that will go is relative to the school would be, I think, would be important to talk about. But, but again, things that are beyond the scope of the conversation to me. But I think those are good points. In the near decade I've lived in town, nothing's been built on. Do we have any information on whether the residents of the aviary were informed at all or how? I, I don't believe so. Well, there was standard notification of the sign, right? You know, so the, the notification that any neighbor would get a plastic sign that says there was going to be a public hearing. Um, but I think it's fair to say it would be contrary to any direction they would logically travel unless they had something to do with the high school. We, we put one on 27 in University right. Park Hill as right. well. Yeah. Okay. We, so we did two. I appreciate it. All right, any other discussion? Seeing so, none. So staff has some conditions, so if we yeah. make the motion with the conditions, is that um, so it? Yeah, so I was, I was gonna say, um, if, uh, if it's okay with everybody, we will accept a motion and a second, uh, and the proposal, whoever makes the motion, uh, controls the conversation as to what conditions are or are not included, and then uh, through acclamation, unless there's objection, We'll entertain a motion uh, in a second, and, and whoever makes the motion is free to accept, alter, change any of the staff <coughs> conditions or, or do with whatsoever they want. Um, and then outside of objection, I will assume that the decision criteria are agreed upon as, as being met. Well, can I propose a proposal? You can propose a proposal. Oh, that's what I'm doing. Yes. <coughs> Go ahead. Well, I'm following very much the staff recommendations on page 10 and saying that those should be incorporated into the proposal. So you're making a motion? Yes, I am making a motion. Awesome, I second it. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you. It's a motion to approve with the staff recommendations. Yes. 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 So uh, we have a motion to approve with the staff recommendations as described number one through four on page 10. And, and, and as a friendly amendment that we accept as the administrative findings, the staff report, is that how we want to kind of do the decision standards? Because they've been analyzing decision standards, right? So that's also on page 10 to review of the relevant decision yeah. standards right before the conditions. So. Okay, great. Yeah. Right. Right. So, so it's I vital that they be included into the proposal. Yep. So we have a motion and a second. Isn't that correct? Mr. Perry, call the roll, please. Okay. Dr. Brithridge? Yes. Mr. Brackman? Yes. Mr. Dana? Yes. Ms. Rosenberg? Yes. Mr. Keebler? No. Mr. Watt? No.
Right, so the motion passes. Uh, next business item is PC 2022-02, conditional use for a new hotel. Uh, the applicant is High Point Lodging, courtesy of Ms. Reed at Bear Becker. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn to public hearing? So moved. I Dr. second. Dr. Frithrich and Mr. Dana, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposition? Mr. Moore, you have the floor. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Second case of the evening, so this is at 5470 College Corner Pike, and this is a conditional use request for a new Holiday Inn Express Hotel. This is PC-2022-02. The applicant for this request is High Point Lodging under the care of Sam Chowdhury, and the property owners are Marsha Hawley and Lindsay Zink. The current use of the property, uh, there really is none. It is vacant, undeveloped. And the property in question we're talking about, 3.475 acres of land that is currently zoned GB General Business. So within the GB General Business District in our code, it is prescribed that hotels, motels are conditional use. So they're allowed in the district so long as you can, um, can obtain conditional use approval. So the proposal, a little bit more detailed on that, is an 83-room hotel. Uh, and again, that's a Holiday Inn Express is the brand that's desired. Here's a look at the site location. So this is directly north of the Ambassador's Point Church, or AP Church for short. So it's outlined here in black. And this is across US 27, College Corner Pike, from the Wildberry Incense Factory. If you were to go further north along 27, you would eventually run into the entrance to Walmart and Schneider Electric, which is up here. That's the intersection that's signaled. And this is also in pretty close proximity to the Family Resource Center and the Tops Food Pantry, which is down here off of Ray's Way, which intersects with 27 at this location right here. Uh, one thing I will note as well, so this particular property, so the 3.4 acres that is the subject of this conditional use hearing, originally connected to the land that is located to the north and would be far above the extent of this map here. That original parcel was a little over 23 acres in size. That was approved for a split last year. Um, and that's documented, I believe, in your staff report as to exactly when that was. Um, but this is something that did come through our office as far as authorizing this split. Uh, I believe AP Church now owns the remainder portion, which is around uh, 20 acres or so. So just a little bit of history and context there. And here is a look at the zoning classifications in the area. So it's kind of a mixture. So the church property, as well as some apartment complexes to the south, those are zoned residentially, R3. Uh, the parcels that you see immediately to the north of the church, the reason they're not in color is because they're in the township. Uh, I don't think I recall exactly what the zoning classification was, but it is a fairly low density district, if I remember correctly. I think it's possibly either an A1 or an R1. Um, if you go immediately over 27 toward the west, so the Wildberry Incense Factory, that is zoned Light Industrial, LI, so that's shown in purple. Uh, but otherwise, if you're looking to the north or immediately to the west, all of the land that's adjacent is also within the same zoning classification within general business or GB. Okay, so just to kind of acquaint you with the site here, I have a series of photos. So this is US 27 that's looking north from Ray's Way, so you can see the crosswalk here. Um, so the site would be on the other side where you see this fencing here. So this is looking at more or less the southeastern corner, the far corner of the site, generally right over here. And then this is looking the opposite direction. So previously we were standing right over here looking sort of this direction. Now we're looking the opposite direction. So this is US 27 looking south and this is the intersection with Rays. You can see that there's the crosswalk there with the signs that are noted. And this is a look, there is an existing curb cut into this site. So the proposal seeks to utilize this existing apron. There may be some improvements to the apron itself just to bring it up to city specifications, 
but this will more or less become the new single entrance point into the hotel development. See the for sale sign there as well. And then, so this is hopping across 27, so this is that same curb cut. There is an existing multi-use path that runs along 27. Uh, I'm not exactly sure whether this was part of the same improvement project that improved 27. There's a chance that it could have been um, that would have widened 27, add, added the turn lane, put in the curves. Um, so this is very much an existing amenity that will be tapped into as a result of this development. Um, you can see there's some street trees that are already pl planted along the trail between the multi-use path and the curb. Then this is looking toward the north, so you can see a look at some existing vegetation that's there along more or less the boundary there, uh, more or less delineating where some of the steeper slopes of the site are located. And so uh, I think there's been a very deliberate effort with this particular plan to try to concentrate the parking and all the developed surfaces on the flattest portion of the site and leave as much of that land as undisturbed as possible. And here's a look, so there is a drainage swale that's existing. I believe it's about 50 feet or so of width, measuring from the back of the multi-use path to what I'll call the ridge or the edge of the swale. Um, so that swale is actually within the public right-of-way. So that swale is more or less not going to be disturbed um, as a result of this project. So uh, the edge of the parking would probably be somewhere along in this vicinity here. And then the walkway uh, that would be leading up to the front entrance of the hotel would be more or less right at the edge of that swale. There may need to be some railing um, just to make sure that that's a safe passageway um, to, in order to navigate from the multi-use path up to the front entrance of the hotel. So here's a bird's eye view. So this gives you a better picture for that finer edge to the existing woods. There is a stream that runs back here as well. Uh, I believe that was shown on the previous slides in better detail, uh, but that stream hopefully will not be too uh, greatly impacted by the development. Uh, there will be a detention basin that is constructed, more or less in this location here, that would probably come in closest contact to that stream. And the drainage swale that I showed you before, so there's a little uh, thicket of woods, uh, if, if you even want to call them woods, uh, that it's there at the southeastern edge or corner of the site and that's right here and then this is looking at from more of a top-down view so just to walk you through where this process has been so this plan was never formally submitted but it was brought to staff this was the original site plan that the applicant brought to us so their original proposal was for a hotel building that actually contained 89 rooms as opposed to 83 and the orientation of this building, as you can see, was quite different from what ended up being submitted. So it was oriented most prominently for the motorists that would be traveling southbound, so coming from the north side of Oxford, less so oriented toward those travelers coming from the south. Also, pretty much the entire parking lot was oriented to, or positioned to be in front of the building, and that was also problematic from a code perspective, which only allows up to 70% of the required parking to be in front of the building. There were also some emergency access issues that our fire chief had communicated to us as far as getting access to all four corners of the building. Uh, with this design, this didn't allow for that. There wasn't any vehicular access of any kind to offer some protection to these sides of the building. So the applicant kindly took our comments and I think we've ended up with a much better plan that helps to fulfill the most important code standards so keeping the vast majority of the parking to the side and to the rear. Um, the dumpster enclosure would be located kind of here in this uh, corner area. Here is the uh, multi-use path and here is that connector piece that runs up to the entrance. So this would be sort of the front canopy entrance to the hotel, uh, kind of like a drop-off area. And uh, you might have noticed so the right-of-way kind of varies. I, uh, like to uh, sort of compare it to the, the edges of mountains almost, like the ridge of mountains uh, kind of zigzags back and forth. So um, the applicant has uh, tried to keep as much of the development features past that right-of-way line as they can um, because more or less the right-of-way that is more or less seen by our service department. So they uh, would 
have more of a direct role in any changes that were to occur in that area. So the changes are limited to more or less the, the entrance, the vehicular entrance, which is here using that existing apron and then the connector over to the entrance, the front uh, door entrance to the hotel. <clears throat> and then this shape right up here, this is the detention basin that's proposed. So if I move to the next slide, so this puts a transparency on the plan. So you can see there will need to be some clear cunning probably that will be involved some regrading of that land in order to accommodate that stormwater piece within that particular area. But otherwise, as you can see, everything else, the parking, the building itself is pretty well kept clear of this, this particular side of the site that is most heavily wooded and has some of the uh, most variation in the topography. So this is looking at the site plan at more of a close up view. And then this is the landscaping version of the plan. So you can see there's a variety of trees. So they're showing deciduous trees, evergreens, uh, shrubbery as well. And I believe this is actually, this is not the most up to date because these trees have since been swapped out for some shrubbery just because, again, because of that drainage swale, it just seemed a little bit better to put some shrubs in there versus some trees. Uh, but those three trees have been relocated elsewhere within the plan itself. So we haven't lost any trees as a result of that. Uh, but it's a total of 63 trees total, 56 shrubs. Um, so staff was very keen to make sure that we were complying to the best degree possible with the standards of the tree preservation ordinance. Um, there is a waiver that's recommended to relieve from the tree survey requirement just because um, we feel like the most important objective is being achieved and that we're getting the development concentrated in the area where we want it to be concentrated. And we're also getting a lot of new trees being planted that previously would not be in existence. So. Um, here is a look at the building elevations. So just to walk you through some of the details on that, they are proposing a combination of, well, it'll be mostly a brick material. I'm sorry, let me go back, hit the wrong button there. It would be mostly a brick material. There would be some ephus, which is like an artificial stucco here in the front facades. There is some articulation in the building as well, which is meeting another code requirement. There's also some uh, stone masonry elements to the architecture. And we are recommending a waiver that the final building permit plans adhere substantially, at least, to these elevations that have been provided at this stage. Um, the glazing of the building is something that is not being met, at least with the strict standard of the code. The minimum is normally 60%. Um, given the use of the building as a hotel, it's not as feasible to meet that um, mm -hmm. since you've broken up the building into a lot of individual compartmentalized um, hotel rooms. So I believe the last time I checked the glazing was around half of that, a little above 30% is where I believe it has ended up. Okay, and then this is a look at the side elevations. So the west side, the east side, this gives you probably the best view of the intended canopy, which is a little bit of a tilt. And uh, these elevations are showing wall signage. Um, however, I don't believe those are the intended sizes. So we have separate sheets that convey the intended wall sign size um, for the structure, which I'll get to here in a moment. Okay. And I figured I would also show you just the first floor, the floor plan for the first floor, not go through all four floors. It'll be a total of four. Um, but just to kind of showcase some of the amenities that are planned, so there would be an indoor pool, a fitness facility, two meeting room spaces, a uh, pretty large lobby area, breakfast nook uh, over here as well, and then the green down here, of course, delineating the canopy. And um, on the first floor, there would be three king-size bed um, hotel rooms and two rooms with double queen. And then on the remaining second, third, and fourth floors, they're pretty similar to one another. On each of those floors, you would have 18 double queen and eight king. So 83, again, 83 hotel rooms in total. <clears throat> and um, the overall parking has come out to a total of 100 parking spaces. Um, that's where we've ended up in our various iterations of this plan. 
Um, so that is meeting the code minimum, which is one per room, but it is giving a little bit of extra parking space for employees or extra visitors, anybody who's attending for a meeting. Um, so there is a little bit of, of flexibility built in there. And of those 100, there would also be four um, accessible ADA spaces. So 96 conventional or regular spaces for ADA is where we ended up on that. Okay, so walking through the signage proposal. So the proposal from the applicant, they're more or less requesting two waivers to code. One has to deal with the size of the signage. The other has to do with the number of signs. So the code only allows for a maximum of two signs on a site, uh, permanent signs for a general business single tenant site, which is what this is, single tenant. And you can have a total of up to two wall signs or you can have one wall sign and one freestanding sign. What is being proposed is two wall signs plus one freestanding sign, so one extra sign in total. The other request has to do with the maximum height uh, of the wall signs, so getting into the size aspect. So this is a representation of the uh, proposed size of the wall signs, so one on the east side, one on the front, of the building and those would be a little bit over 16 and a half feet of height. Um, the code maximum height is three feet. So anytime there's a building that the average setback is less than 100 feet from the right of way, the maximum height for a sign is three feet. So that should give you an impression there's a pretty significant degree of variation between this little red bar here and the overall um, sort of height of this sign. So including the the lettering and the logo or medallion that sits above it. Um, the monument sign, the freestanding sign that they're proposing, it's in the right location. It would meet the proper setback um, per the code, but the issue would be, again, the sign height. So the maximum height for a ground sign or freestanding sign is six feet. So they are proposing it at eight feet, so it would be taller than the typical um, man, as you can see here. Okay, so the staff is recommending approval of this conditional use, and I'll go through each of the conditions and kind of outline what the rationale is behind each of those. So the first condition is just clarifying that staff does not support any of the signed waivers that have been requested. We did offer the potential that if the applicant wanted to send us alternate plans to show reduced sign sizes that were maybe a little bit larger than what was allowed by code, they did have that option. They chose not to exercise that option at this point. Um, so because we don't really have any other alternate plans to react to, we wouldn't recommend entertaining any waivers until such time as such plans were or could be submitted. <clears throat> so what this condition is recommending is that all signage shall comply with the zoning code requirements for GB, so no waivers to sign size or number would be granted by virtue of the approval. Condition number two is just making sure that the buildings are gonna be built more or less as they're presented to you right now with the elevations. Um, condition number three is just kind of a helpful reminder there at the building permit stage for the administrator review, we're checking for lighting compliance, so pole heights and adequate lighting for security, um, meeting the glare type requirements, and those types of details don't typically get submitted as part of conditional use, so that's just there as a reminder when it comes time for the administrative review of the permit. Condition four, so this has a lot to do with the comments that were expressed by the fire chief in terms of um, creating potential bottleneck issue at that single access point. Um, there was a previous iteration of the plan that was kind of between that most original one that you saw had all the parking in front and the one that you are seeing now that's been formally submitted. Um, there was one that did show a total of two curb cuts. Um, we as community development staff, we think it should be one curb cut as opposed to two just to av avoid um, excess crossings across that multi-use path and for a variety of reasons. Uh, where that second curb cut would go um, across from Ray's Way would likely be the location. There would be probably considerable engineering that would have to be done to make that area work from a stormwater perspective just because where that existing swale is and whatnot. Um, but I did want to throw this in here just as a way to offer some flexibility that 
when it did come to administrative review, if there was um, a way to sort of widen that driveway out to um, help alleviate the potential at least for a bottleneck issue that if people ended up parking on that driveway and, and uh, were blocking up the potential for emergency access into the site, um, that that could hopefully be better avoided with a little bit wider of a driveway. So um, just indicating that we're not locking ourselves into a 24 foot wide entrance, which is what is more or less shown on the plan at this point. Condition five is a waiver for the glazing to reduce it from 60% to down to about a little over 30% is how I calculated it. Condition six is a waiver to the maximum building height. Um, and we did run this by the fire chief as well. He is supportive of this waiver. It's only by a few feet and it's primarily just accounting for a parapet wall for the structure. Um, so it is a four story tall structure, which is as you, I'm sure you know, it's pretty common in Oxford, especially uptown here, the four-story buildings that we see. Um, so not too much of a concern there, but it is needing to be acknowledged as a waiver. Condition seven, I will not read that paragraph, but that goes into the typical details that we talk about with landscaping, the relief from the tree survey requirement, but making sure that that landscaping plan is fulfilled and that any areas that are to remain undisturbed do in fact remain undisturbed uh, as a result of the construction. Um, condition eight is a waiver for allowing parking spaces in the front yard setback. So the reason for this has to do with the way that the right-of-way line factors into the proposal. I think the spirit of most setback regulations, in particular the front yard setback, is that they're typically measured from the back of the walkway or the sidewalk, or in this case the multi-use path. And a lot of that distance is already being made up with what is a very wide right-of-way to begin with. Um, so I think the spirit of the code is being met with the proposal, even though if you were to measure truly based on how it's written, it's not in compliance, but we do support a waiver to it. Condition number nine is a waiver uh, granted to allow some parking um, immediately to the east of the entrance to be five feet away as opposed to six feet from that right-of-way line, and that's just to um, bump out that pedestrian walkway as much as possible and then allow enough room so that the shrubbery that is now planned can be planted along the edge adjacent to the swale. And then condition 10 is a waiver acknowledging that drive aisles uh, do not necessarily all have to be perpendicular to one another. And uh, where this comes into play is in that southeastern corner that's a little bit awkward just based on the geometry of the site. And we felt it was essential in this case to help to boost the vehicular parking, just given the isolated nature of this site, there's not a lot of other opportunities for parking nearby. Um, so we felt it was necessary, especially in this case, and again, to help prevent that bottleneck issue that the fire chief was concerned about at the entrance, that we have more parking. And we're um, gracious that, uh, well, we're grateful that the applicant has been gracious enough to provide that parking, but in order to do so, it comes as a, a little bit more of a triangular arrangement, if you will, as opposed to a typical parking lot layout. Okay, so that concludes all the conditions and the rationales for those conditions. So with that, that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions for Mr. Moore? I might have one. Um, so under stamp recommendations, uh, all portions of the mature vegetation area in the northwest corner of the site uh, which are free and clear of plan development features shall remain undisturbed so to uh, not have to go through a tree survey when i look at the blueprints it looks like the retention basin would go into a significant chunk of that is that likely the case that is that is the case and i think this slide best demonstrates that yeah. so and, and that is certainly a, a, a valid um, discussion point for the commission at this stage is if you feel like this is fitting too much into this site then maybe something needs to be changed about it but staff's assessment of this is yes there will be a little bit of a pocket that is lost um, we we are appreciative that the applicant has reduced the size of the hotel too because originally it was 89 rooms now we're down to 83 but there are those stormwater functions that are pretty essential that have to be met um, the city engineer did have some comments to that effect that there would need to be some kind of a design solution that would be reached at the time when these plans are done in more of an engineering level detail 
So actually, I think that would be a great question for the applicant is if they have an idea on exactly what that solution might be and what the, the level of impact might be to those, those woods in that area. Mm -hmm. I have a question, uh, not about the woods, but the same uh, part of the footprint. As I have looked at the various um, uh, drawings and maps, I'm having a hard time figuring out where that basin aligns with the street. Yeah, in the ones where we have the basin, I see tree line impact and tree line, but then in other ones without the, the building footprint, I see um, the, the creek or the water line. So that's, that's where I'm having a little trouble figuring out how these overlay and overlap. And I think the, the only slide that I have, unfortunately, would be this one. And um, I, I actually don't know the data source on that. I doubt that that is from USGS, but this this could be a stream that has meandered over time too. So a lot of this might have to involve some ground truthing to find out exactly where that stream is. And hopefully there would be some efforts here in terms of uh, certainly probably a, a, an NPDES permit um, and, and in terms of you know mitigation, stormwater quantity, quality, all of that. Um, so hopefully the stream's location would be respected as a part of that. Um, but if I had to try to delineate the location of that stream as best I could on top of the site plan view of the proposal, let's go back to here, probably somewhere in this general vicinity right here. So somewhat uh, adjacent to the proposed Uh, I believe so, okay. yes. Uh, is that codified uh, or would that need to be a condition uh, that it meets all geological and, I mean, I know with environmental protection that's in there, but um, I was a little confused or I, I guess I have questions about some of the wording you would hope that they would. My, my perspective on it is if you feel like that's concerning or problematic from a planning standpoint um, and, and you feel like this layout isn't comfortable enough from to that regard, then what should probably be entertained is some kind of a design change. Um, I don't think a condition necessarily would work to much benefit um, because those processes and procedures, if we're talking about NPDES, EPA, water quality, all of that, that is more or less operating outside of the city umbrella. Um, there may be some strings attached with respect to engineering review, service department, etc., but I'm not exactly what those might be, um, if there are any, but, um, and that might be something the applicant could elaborate on as well. Well, and I guess another way to ask it is if, if, and again, not knowing where the water goes, I mean, I have a dry creek that gets, you know, sporadically full. But according to that first chart, it impacts six, seven properties, and I know it's adjacent to the Walmart retention. So it, that's why I want to make sure, because one of the things we, we discuss quite a bit is the impact to adjacent properties. So I just want to make sure that we're, if it's codified and it's something that is an engineering requirement or, or mitigation, and if you think of like South Point and some of those, um, like Forest, we have a lot of detail and information on the econom or ecological and topographical impact that I didn't see, and if I missed it from this lovely ream of paper, Can I just ask a quick technical question? Does our code prohibit the construction of a stormwater basin within the front yard setback, or would that need to be? In terms of design flexibility, is there a front yard setback that's pushing the stormwater basin in any particular direction or no? I know parking, can, there are prohibitions there. I, I don't believe we have a standard to that effect as it relates to stormwater features. Okay, thank you. Primarily like structures and things like that, parking. All right, great. Sir, any other questions for Mr. Moore? All right, thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Um, Ms. Reed? I was looking for you. We were behind Mr. Potter, and I couldn't see you. You were still here. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Good evening, Etta Reed with Bear Beckers, um, 110 South College Avenue, Oxford, Ohio. Um, I'm here on behalf of High Point Lodging. Representatives and the owner of High Point Lodging are also here with me today. So if you have any specific questions for them, I know they'll be more than happy to answer them for you. 
a little bit about um, High Point Lodging. They do have 40 years of experience in the hotel industry. Um, they are a family owned um, business. They actually build and operate all their own hotels. And they currently have 12 hotels. The proposed um, application before you tonight is for a Holiday Inn Express and Suites. It will have 83 guest rooms as well as a 50 person meeting room and a boardroom that can accommodate about 12 to 15 people. A fitness center, an indoor pool, and a business center. I know Zach did a good job kind of showing you the floor plan, so I'm not going to bore you to death with that. But we do have some nice um, photos and renderings of some of the facilities so you can see the quality and the color um, that, you, that you can expect with this development. The lobby, as you can see, is very colorful, very high end. Some of the guest rooms, hallways, kind of like an office center fitness center for the guests, as well as there's just a kind of a photo of the, the entry. There's, there's the um, conference room, as well as a board room. And again, some more guest rooms. And then this is just a photo of the sign. One thing about Holiday Inn Express and on the suites is that they do have a good following and a loyal customers. Um, a lot of their customers are repeat guests and they actually, when they come to town, that's the hotel that, of their choice versus like a Marriott or a Hilton. I want to just touch on some of the economic impact of this hotel will bring to both Butler County and more importantly, the city of Oxford. They're looking to add 31 jobs. As you can see, it's broken down anywhere from the food and beverage front desk to the management. They'll have six full-time employees with an average salary of $45,000 a year, as well as 25 part-time employees with an average hourly rate of $12. They're projected to have 25,000 stays per year. Um, in year one, that, that equates to about $2.9 million. Um, as you can see, there's quite a nice um, tax collection benefit to both the county and the city. Um, just under 190,000 for the county sales tax, as well as 190,000 for the city's lodging tax, and of course, you always have the property tax. Um, in the surrounding areas, as you're aware, there's not a whole lot of hotels once you leave Oxford. <laughs> you're going to Hamilton; they have one. Um, you know, with Spooky Nook coming along, and just Miami and and, the, and everything they have, there is a need for hotel rooms right now in the. Um, Oxford area there's only 322 so you add our 83 we're you know right around 400 mark um, you know the current hotel hotels also do not offer suites so they will have the Holiday Inn Express will have 30 suites for extended stay guests so maybe you have a visiting professor or a family that wants to come and stay a little longer than a weekend to stay with a family member who's sick, a, a student who's sick there, you know, and as we mentioned, there's a large amount of um, loyal customers who receive points, similar to a, you know everybody has the loyalty programs now, so they will receive points for each day. And so, since there is not a Holiday Inn Express in town currently, they have to go all the way to Harrison or Fairfield. That's taking those dollars, those dining dollars, those shopping dollars with them, and we don't have that here. And so, that would be another great reason, um, you know, for this hotel, for the Holiday Inn Express. This will be a two, over a $10 million project. Um, and it'll bring construction workers. It'll take us two years to construct. So again, there's two years of lunches. There's two years that those construction workers will need a place to stay at other hotels within the community. So it's bringing you know, more people, more faces to the Oxford community. But enough about the economics. I wanna dig in a little more to the site plan. Zach did a great job explaining it. Again, I'm not gonna dig too deep. Um, as we mentioned, the existing vegetation uh, kind of in the northwest corner is going to remain the detention basin. We are looking to do a surface basin. Um, we do need to determine the exact location of the stream. Um, obviously, if we, deter if we get into the, the stream, we would have to get permits from the Army Corps, Ohio EPA. We're fully aware of that. Um, we, what our intention is to do is go down near the, near the, the um, stream, but not into the stream. We'd have to build a dike, fortify the backside of that dike so it doesn't erode away, and build that basin there. Um, 
if that, you know, we have backup options if for some reason that doesn't work out and the permits don't come through, we could always do an underground detention basin. That's not what we would prefer. We would prefer the surface basin, but there's options. We're not left high and dry per se. Um, we have exceeded the parking requirements as Zach had indicated, um, but that's only because we are asking for some waivers. So I would appreciate that, that grant team here in the future, here coming up. Um, we do have the multi-use path across the front shown in yellow and it is extending north into the site and then we do have a continue a little walk cutting through under the canopy to get you through to the front door which will be very nice because we do have 15 bicycle spaces so even if i'm out of town i can come in have my bike on the back and um you know hop off get on the trail and i'm into town easily or on the oats trail around town With the conditional use, as you're aware, there are specific concerns in your code that have to be addressed. And so the three specific concerns for a motel hotel are the proximity to residential. So while the property to the east, both in the township and in the city, is zoned residential, it's not developed as such. Um, the property in the township is vacant, and the property obviously immediately next to us on 27 is a church. So while we are adjacent to residential, it's not really functioning and, and developed as residential. Um, screening from residential is the next concern. Um, we are providing a landscape buffer along the whole west, I'm sorry, the whole east side of the property, which is which is the property that is zoned residential. And then lastly, the appropriate street access. We have also wonderful access on US 27. We're gonna use the existing um, drive apron, and if necessary, we will definitely bring it up to code. Again, here's our landscape plan. It's very robust. We provide buffering from the, for the parking along both 27 and then on the east side, and then just nice trees um, along the back. And then we are also providing some landscaping there along 27. I think there was some concern about it being too close to 27, <coughs> maybe in the front yard. We are gonna provide, as you can see, some landscape buffering there to kind of just kind of blend it all in. There are several waiver requests that Zach had mentioned. Um, I just wanna hit on, of course, the tree survey waiver. We are preserving the existing trees in the northwest portion. The area that's crosshatched are the exempt areas. So as you're aware in your code, any area and just outside the parking areas and the buildings are exempt as well as the detention basins. The, the next waiver has to deal with the building. There's actually two waivers we're requesting, which is the glazing, which as Zach has indicated is very difficult with a hotel to meet the 60%. And then the second one is the building height. Where I have that yellow, that is where the 45 feet is. So you can see the majority of the building is right, you know, the majority of the building is at 45 feet, 11 and a half inches. But we have some architectural elements and we have extended the parapet walls in some locations. And that's really which brings us up to the 48 feet, nine and a half inches. Parking. There are several um, waivers we're asking for. The, the parking spaces highlighted in red are located in the front yard setback. The red dashed line is the front yard setback. The little bubbled area in yellow is where we are encroaching into the six foot. It's only in that one little corner. And that again is so that we could put those 13 spaces there. And then the purple diagonal line is where we are, um, our dry aisles are not perpendicular. And the last series of waivers that we're requesting has to deal with signage. Um, the first one is the freestanding sign as um, code does indicate that we are required to have a maximum six foot high sign. We are at eight foot height. Uh, but one thing I would like to note is that while we have exceeded the height by two feet, we have left, if you wanna say a lot of square footage on the table, um, we are allowed to have a 48 foot square foot sign per side and we're only at 25 feet, just over 25 feet per side. So we could make the sign larger, but we, we can take it two feet shorter, but we can make it a lot larger. So we've decided to go with about two feet taller and make the, the actual sign face a little smaller. And then the wall sign. Um, as, as, code, as staff has indicated and code has required, the, um, the maximum height of a building sign is three feet tall, which as you can see, doesn't even, it's only half of our H for the Holiday Inn and Express. Our, our buildings are 48, 49 feet tall. Those signs are approximately 29 feet above the ground. So when you put a three foot by, you know, a three foot sign, 29 feet off the ground, you're not going to see it. 
And so we're asking for some, some flexibility there to allow us to put a sign that can actually be read from a distance <coughs> because our, our building is also located, you know, and it's not right on 27 either, it's pushed back. So we would ask for some flexibility with the size of the, the wall sign, as well as we are asking for, code, we're asking for three signs total. Code allows two. We're, we are asking for a freestanding sign as well as two building signs. We have one a wall sign on the front and a wall sign on the east side. And so that would be, that's kind of our whole signage um, request for waivers. We have read um, all the staff's conditions. We have no problem with them all except number one, which is the sign waivers. We would ask that you grant us a waiver on the signage. Um, <coughs> other than that, we would just appreciate your recommendation of approval to council. And as I mentioned, Hyde Lodging is here as well as myself to answer any questions you may have. So he volunteered. All right. At this point, I will entertain. You can summon him. Legitimately. At this point, I'll entertain comments from the public uh, of, pertaining to this proposal. It seems a popular uh, request is for our fire chief. So, thank you, sir. I, I love that Mr. Keebler volunteered you. <laughs> Dick knows me well. <laughs> <laughs> My name is John Dethrick and I serve as the fire chief here in Oxford. Um, you know, I think everybody will agree that it's a great thing to have some more hotel rooms here in town and also have some tax paying jobs here. <coughs> I know that's definitely something that makes me happy. Um, my job in this process is to make sure that we can keep that place open and providing uh, hotel rooms and taxes through the jobs. Um, to do that, I think to efficiently, efficiently do that, uh, we need a second entrance into the place. Uh, the way this drawing is set up currently, uh, there is one, one entrance which someone lays a, uh, a supply line of hose down that one entrance, we're done. So if the first truck into that, that facility lays a hose to get water, um, there's nothing else going in there. There's no ladder truck, there's no second engine, no second water supply, it's over. Um, and I'm assuming, you know, obviously at this stage we don't have any uh, building drawings or anything like that submitted yet, but I'm assuming this is gonna be a stick built structure, be a wooden structure. So not only is there the, uh, the fear of a fire in this building once it's built, there's also a fear of a fire in this building while it's under construction which will take a lot of water to try to put out. Um, obviously the building will be sprinkled, but there are still outstanding issues bes besides the um, occupied portions of the building. When you have a wood structure like that, behind the walls, a plumber soldering a joint in the wall, and the place is off to the races. Um, like I said, I just wanna make sure that uh, we can provide the service that we need to to keep this place here for many years. And I'd entertain any questions you might have. All right, thank you, sir. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public that would like to speak on this matter? Mr. Krokenbanger. Thank you again. Hello again. Uh, just speaking to some of the economic uh, numbers that were shared previously by Ms. Reed, um, just wanted to speak to those. One, uh, in working with our partners at Miami University as well as the Visitors Bureau in Joy Oxford, they have indicated a significant uh, shortage of uh, hotel rooms, not only in the city of Oxford, but kind of broadly in Butler County as a direct impact from Spooky Mill. Uh, so often hotels in Hamilton and uh, Westchester really serve as kind of an overflow or spillover for Miami's biggest uh, weekends. Uh, and those are really starting to see bookings all the way into 2024 in anticipation of events at Spooky Mill. Not to mention um, the opportunity for uh, 
increased stays here within town for our own events. Miami's events, um, our scale, youth sporting events through our Parks and Rec Department and so on. So I do think the addition of a hotel uh, certainly is a, is a benefit to it. Uh, some of the, the employment numbers that were shared, just looking at those a little bit more deeply, um, it's 31 positions. The full-time equivalent is probably a little closer to 18 to 20, given the number of part-time positions that are there. And then on some of the, um, the numbers shared for hourly wages and salaries, the market will determine some of those. So I, you know, I think that there could be um, some other things to be seen there. Specifically, then looking and thinking about um, the, this particular project, I think there is some credence to be lended to the idea of a Holiday Inn brand and the strength of that brand as a value add to the city of Oxford. Um, and then the, the design, the number of rooms available in this hotel is the largest uh, number of, of uh, rooms at any property in and around Oxford. The only thing that uh, exceeds this is Houston Woods and you have to count the cabins to get to that. Um, but even uh, beyond that, the number of double queens is, uh, is something that's particularly of interest to Miami's athletics department. The number of teams, uh, visiting teams that come in, they want to put two uh, pair of athletes in a room. So I do think there, there are some sp uh, features specific to this project um, that uh, we would support from an economic development standpoint. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Any other comments from the public? All right, seeing none, I will accept the motion to adjourn from public hearing. So Mr. Dana with the motion. Second. Mr. Keemler with the second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye, aye. Any opposition? All right, we are in discussion mode, my friends. There's one comment that arises from looking at page 44 toward the bottom. The last preliminary submission contained two entrance exits to the parking lot to allow for emergency vehicle ingress. Further down in that paragraph, it speaks about parking, and it speaks about more parking helping to solve the problem of a potential bottleneck. At least that's what I read. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. Now, if my question or my concern is additional parking spaces, which helps, it says here, to alleviate the potential for a bottleneck issue at the single curb cut entrance point on College Corner Pike, does the addition of more parking spaces solve the problem? The way it's stated is, we're going to help solve it. We're going to quote unquote help solve it by more additional parking. That's the way it's stated. And let, let Mr. Keebler explain. Well, I think he corrects me if you have the fire chief did the help, but it's not good enough. That's why I got the question. So I think that I think that's what he's saying. Yes. And uh, is it the Gulf thing that just said that I have to laugh about? Where are you going to park the bus? <laughs> there, there's there's not enough parking in there to even think about putting a bus if that place is full. So uh, Miami could be happy if I, I guess you can pop up in the Walmart lot and walk down or something, but you know that doesn't help. A couple of comments for me. Um, I think that the second entrance is important, and there's no reason why it can't go right out the uh, east end of that or south end whatever you want to call it to a curb cut right there it seems to me that it's a natural it shouldn't be any problem whatever yeah they need to cover a little more of the drainage ditch or build a culvert there but i don't see why it can't why it can't happen as far as the signage is concerned i want to remind us that we just turned down Oversized mon um, monument sign on the south end of town. Okay, so I think we do have to be careful why we can allow this one. Okay. Secondly, I don't think there's anything wrong with the two wall signs. And I think the easiest way to solve it, as far as size or whatever, is to say the two wall signs should be the same size as they have at the Hampton Inn because we approved two wall signs there. And they're not three foot square. And that should be something that they can make work. So you have to be towed on the monument sign. You can do the two wall signs, but 
there shouldn't be any larger than what was approved on the last hotel that we approved in town. And actually there are people seen it or not seen it. Yeah. But you know, talk about CNN anyway. We didn't like, oh gee, there's a holiday in, so we'll stop. <laughs> you know? It doesn't matter that much, but I think we could be consistent here by saying the approved one at, at the last hotel that was built here and we should probably approve something of the same size similar square footage uh, I don't think it's anywhere near as tall as what they're asking for and I'd like to see instead of saying the signage will comply let's go ahead and get this over with the monument sign needs to comply the other two we can have two wall signs but they should be the same as what was allowed in the next again and it needs a second It's a good project. So yes, I want to thank, I, I can see that this has evolved in conversations between the applicant and staff. And so it's always nice when it gets to me and I feel like all the questions have been answered, but the product is better for having thought through some of the design issues. Yeah, big picture stuff. I mean, Oxford needs a hotel. The more hotels we have, the less pressure we have convert houses into Airbnbs, which is an acute affordability problem that we have. Um, this is a well-designed project that's permitted in the zone. And again, this is a conditional use, so it's about mitigating some of the potential negative impacts, which I feel like have been mitigated through good design, the screening and the robust landscaping schedule and all that stuff. Um, so I, I'm in total support of it. Uh, the, the main questions are for me that I totally get the desire for the second entrance on that very occasional and you hope never need that you would need all the fire trucks there and one of the entrances is blocked with a hose. But every curb cut you have is a, is a conflict point that's there every day, all day, for the 100% of the time. And so I think that for, for we have to be careful to not add entrances um, on the you know, if you can maintain the safety without adding the entrance, I think it's better. Um, I do think that a 24 foot entrance is basically two vehicular travel lanes. And so the odds of it being blocked are really, really, really low. Until they start parking. Until they, well, and I think that that's a, something that could be managed for sure. Here's a question that I have, yeah. is that um, I really am hesitant, I do not support a second entrance. But if one were really, really worried about it, Miami, for example, has satisfied the fire marshal and some of its dorms by having a multi-use path that's surrounded by reinforced something. So you could pull a fire truck into a quad on that once in a million chance that you needed to do that. If one really, really needed to do that, could the multi-use path not provide that like once in a million, you could get something up in there um, as, a, as a fallback position. Um, I'm not a fire marshal, I just know that on campus they solved it in part that, so anyway, I'm in support of the project. I think all the code conditions have been met. I, I think that the question of the signs, I'm with Mr. Moore, I'd like to see what the proposal is before I vote on it. I like where you're going with that. Uh, and, and maybe if that's what's communicated to the applicant, then, then they, can, they can show us something that the council could then, staff could evaluate. So anyway, that's, that's my, I really do wish, this is my last thing I'm gonna say, I, I, I feel like, we trade off environmental values because we're trying to handle stormwater and we push the stormwater basins into the forests. And I feel like there's gotta be a better way than the way we're doing it. I'm not sure what it is. Um, I wish we could handle the stormwater in not such a space extensive way that then would require those trade offs. Um, and so I would love to see that there was some design solution that, that didn't require that. Um, but I think at the level of conditional use, I'm not gonna engineer that for now. So any of the designs, do you have any hypothetical ideas of what the designs might be that you see? Well, I, you know, I just, um, again, I'm not an engineer, I've not seen the, the, the topography of yeah, the site. you know the event. Well, I, you know, I think that the, the, the more you could reduce the impervious surface, the less water di discharge you'd have to accommodate. So if there were low impact design solutions that could help 
reduce the stormwater, then maybe it wouldn't need to be sized quite so large. Um, that's really the only thing, and as whether some other possible contour of it, but again, I can't engineer that here. I, I would like to see the impact on the forest minimized. Yeah, I was gonna say that uh, <coughs> I concur that this is something that's needed in town in general. People come in all the time and they don't have enough places to stay, but also the bigger impact on Airbnbs, right? You relieve some of that pressure, um, and so there's less demand, and so hopefully it doesn't, it helps relieve some of the housing uh, uh, r reduction and increase in costs uh, because of the large bit. Um, but I defer to our experts, our fire chief, when it comes to safety. Um, I think I've been pretty consistent on that, and I'd, I'd like to stick with that. If they're all alternatives, like you mentioned, that our chief is uh, okay with, that, that would work for me, but that's something that's important. I believe the water main out on Todd's Corner Pike is on the other side of the road which means to feed that property, they've got to feed it with two water lines, the house line and the fire line, correct? Well, how about they increase the size of the fire line and make sure there's a hydrant right up there at the corner coming in to the building? Would it be similar to the ones uptown where it's the fire access built into the building? Like well, there has to be that. But right now, you've got to lay a line across College Corner Pike. Oh, I see. Okay, the other side of the road. The dumb thing the city did when they went out there, they should have had every other hydrant on the other side of the road, but they didn't do it. Okay? <laughs> so, if you have a fire on that side of the road on College Corner Pike, the road shut down. So if you haven't had all your trucks or everybody coming in by the time that you do that, You've got no help there because you can't drive over a five inch fire hose. Okay? So I think part of the condition here would be to, that the fire line be as, that they have put in anyway, be a sufficient size that there can be a hydrant up at the north west corner of the building. Thank you, sir. That would still kind of put all of our eggs in one basket. Indeed. We'd be relying on a private fire hydrant that we don't really control the maintenance of. And during the winter, that thing's frozen. I'm in the same boat that I am now. Well, now you're double double, Tom. I got to have water. <laughs> While you're up here, uh, that did you want to be a major improvement to not have to lay five inch hose across the college corner pipe? Sure. Um, while you're up here, would you mind answering um, uh, Dr. Prithich's comments about a multi use path maybe providing access if we put barriers on the side? So, that decision to use that stuff at the university is probably one of the things that I've been involved in here that I regret the most. Um, it is maintenance intensive. You never know when it's been dug into. You never know what they put back when it's done. Um, there's several spots where we have gone off the road and onto that stuff and it ruts it up. Um, apparently it works at Disneyland, but we're not at Disneyland. <laughs> so but, <laughs> so but, I'm, I'm not a fan. So, but just thinking about the, uh, I mean, I don't know what, you could put the odds of a fire occurring at a site are, are small odds. They're super important, but they're small. And then the odds that you would block, there would be a fire and the main entrance would be blocked, reduces your odds even further. So my, my thing is, is it worth building a second entrance with the cost and the negatives that, that would accrue every single day for that very small chance? Or, for example, could a, a multi-use path be made to work for that, that one really, really, really rare circumstance that you have a fire and the main entrance is blocked? So you could at least I mean, maybe it's a bollard and you could get up in there in that 0.001% chance that that happens. You know, on the other side of the coin, there's 32 curb cuts between that property and Church Street. I mean, what are the chances that's the one where there's going to be a problem? Um, I mean, we could sit and 
what if it all, all day long, but. So I guess, is it technically feasible that that could provide spillover in that rare, rare circumstance that it could be engineered to support? If it was paved, I wouldn't care, but I don't want that stuff that they use over there. I don't want to see that expanded anymore in the city. I don't, I don't think it's. Mr. Carter? We're drafting a condition over here that would, I think, maybe meet both goals, uh, perhaps, and putting you on the spot here, but uh, we might be able to come up with something that is only used in emergency situations, but supports apparatus. Yeah, I'm good with that. Okay. I mean, I wouldn't want to see it and sure. have a better idea of it, but sure. conceptually, I mean, I'm, yeah. And it I'm may not be that. able to be fast, but. Yeah. I mean, that to me, I'm, I'm looking at the church on the east that has a, you know, that sure. we, we did that, I think, on the, the on the, the what are we call, I would call it industrial park that was just recently approved. Sure. That there was, it. there was just an emergency secondary access that was feasible in that rare circumstance. So. Mr. Rosenberg, Mr. Bracken, Mr. Kudiboy. So, following Commissioner, do we have any more for these fire chiefs? Because I really want to. Yeah, I was going to gonna ask if we have any more for. Because. All right, I think you're off the hook for a second. <laughs> I'll be over here if you need me. All right. So, given what the fire chief has said, and also my own experience with fallback on planning commission for really terrible parking lots. I don't see why, like, what is a conflict point? Are you, are you referring to possibility of accident? Is that what you're? Well, there's a concept of, of access management. Think about Locust Street by, by, by Kroger. One of the reasons it's so accident prone and terrible for bicycles and pedestrians is you've got so many different access points. So the concept of access management is trying to reduce those points of conflict so there's one entrance and not two or three or four. But, because each one of those things is a car pulling in and out, right. crossing over multi-use path, so, so that's the trick. But I would argue that having one entrance also increases, okay, and I don't have like a planning <laughs> degree or understand you know, some of the things that you do, but just as a driver in this town, yeah, I agree with you that Locust Street for Kroger has too many of that, and I think part of the problem is not that there's too many, but there's like too many ways to get to those, if that makes sense. Uh, based on this plan, we're not talking about a lot of different ways to get to these entrances. We're, we're talking about like, this goes forward and then it goes around the building and has a lot of parking. So I don't see it as a, as a similar thing to the Locust Street because of how that parking lot is constructed. but. What I see so many times is, is I mean, let's look at uh, where the library is, right? Of course, we always bring that up. But, like, there are not enough entrances to that, and they're not wide enough. And, um, or, or I should say, there, there's not enough ways to travel through there without a lot of blockage, without the possibility of pedestrians getting hurt, without... You know, I don't know the statistics of that particular development, but what I see on, on 27 is if there were two, I mean, I, I totally trust the fire chief and what he says both about the multi-use path and about how it would be more effective to have two entrances. Well, as a driver, I also would like to see two entrances because there, that, that's, this is not a large parking lot and there is not a lot of like pavement in front of the building. so. Uh, with that big canopy there and everything, yeah, it's going to get blocked up with one entrance, I think. So that's where I fall on that. Um, I want to talk about the signs real quick. I'm so tired of talking about signs. This is a huge hotel. I completely agree that you should look at like the Hampton Inn, for instance, and see what the size is because you can't say what's good for like Burger King signage is going to be in any kind of proportion with a with a hotel. Um, you're completely, you know, Mr. Key was completely correct in saying that when you have this tiny H like in the corner of this building, it's it's going to look dumb as well as not providing really any information. 
And so I would. I'm just trying to keep it easy and keep it moving. Right, right. Okay, that's great. Okay, come back with this coach. And yeah, exactly. No further. And so, so yeah, so that's those are the two things that I have to say. Is I, I hope we can clean up this the sign code because it's. It, I really think it needs to be a proportion of the building. So this is not the first time that I've. Yeah. <laughs> First time that I felt that like like some of these buildings are larger than others, um, and then I, I completely agree about two entrances, um, not just for safety. Well, completely for safety, but also for convenience. So, Mr. Bracken, uh, I don't mind two entrances at all. I don't think it would be a problem. They're going to be 100, 200 feet away from each other, so I don't think they're too close, which I think is the problem on Locust Street. Um, that being said, I don't mind other alternatives as long as they're fire chief is satisfied with the safety of it that's my biggest concern signage I also I generally don't care all I try and do is keep it consistent to the rules that we have and variances that are consistent between similar conditions um, so I totally understand it being larger and what you recommended I think is totally reasonable Mr. Kimmel? I want to come back to bias if we don't want a private one let's put one at least on that side of the road where they're bringing a line across and it's a city item I mean, it, this needs to be done, okay? This is a conditional use. We're not out of the realm to ask for it. So it'll be put in at the contractor's expense, the size line that will support the fire hydrant and service his um, sprinkler system. With respect to entrances, I, ha I can't help but say I feel conflicted. I have the greatest respect for the fire chief and what he felt was right. But the reason I do is because I'm listening to some of the points that Judge Quick has made. And there's percentages quoted like the number of times being period 001, whatever. And I'm, you're, you're speaking about a, uh, the, the single entrance as, is, has support. And I'm trying to further understand that in order to make a decision. Well, would you elaborate on that just enough so that I can grasp it? So, so I think that, my, I guess, I don't know what the language that staff is crafting, but I think agreeing that there should be a secondary emergency access, like I think we can all ag agree on that. It, the odds of it are small, but I think we would all like to not be to locked into a single entrance. The question of whether then the cost of construction and, and all the traffic that a second entrance would generate planned around that emergency, emergency access. Uh, is, so to me, I would love to have some kind of way in which an emergency secondary access were provided without needing that, that additional vehicular enter, entrance. And so to me, it's like, and again, I don't know that I can enter, we could say that we could require them to have a secondary um, driveway entrance, or we could, I mean, what's the, what's the condition that you're thinking about right now, Zach, is it? So, may I? You can answer, but I also I, I have an option that might alleviate some of this, uh, Robin. Okay. Um, yeah, I think I can share a few thoughts. So um, I did craft a condition that would be more along the lines of Dr. Prithrich and, and his idea for um, possibly using the multi-use path as an emergency access point. So um, a condition could be worded as an emergency access point shall be explored and implemented to the greatest degree possible without creating a second vehicular access point or curb cut for regular traffic. That's the way that at least I would word it if it were in line with um, Dr. Prithridge's proposal. There would probably be another condition I would have to craft it with if it was indeed a true second vehicular access point that was available there for regular traffic on top of emergency access. Um, and I'd also be curious or if, if the commission was inclined to, you know, start basically uh, in, in description way, start, starting to redesign the site plan, um, it might be helpful to just get the applicant's perspective as to whether they agree to these conditions as we're writing them. So one, one suggestion or thought I had is half of a pork chop. So if you make a northbound in only, the fire truck doesn't need to get out quickly. Could you repeat, would you mind repeating that? A northbound one-way right turn in. Yeah. 
So it, it reduces the uh, conflict point because you don't have vehicles coming out. The fire truck can take its sweet old time coming out. It needs to get in. So if you put that, to Mr. Keebler's, on the on what was technically would be the southern point, and it was in, or even some marriage of the two ideas where there is a curb cut, but it is, you know, a paved sidewalk that the truck could get over if it needed to, you could put it at the south side, and it's it's not the impact of a traditional con uh, it, conflict point. Can, can I, like, why can't there be a second, like, why... With outbound traffic, you can, you can hit a biker. With inbound traffic, the biker sure. will see the inbound car um, or, or a conflict point. Plus the volume of traffic going in and out, it's going to be certain times of the day. So you're you're not going to have consistent traffic where you would need I got that. you. I just, uh, the reason I say that so emphatically is, <laughs> I mean, this is Walnut. And this is like a major road. I respect bikers and pedestrians. There's more people going in and out of Burger King's one driveway than will go in and out of this on a daily basis. Yeah. This is the, I mean, I keep comparing it to Dunkin' Donuts is kind of it. This is the hotel. People come in and, and then they leave. I mean, I guess what I would say is that I think that there seems to be consensus among the commission that we need to look at a secondary emergency access, whether or not we here at this level, because there's multiple steps, right? It's going to go to council, be a second reading, additional staff. So if we can set what the requirement, like, what Dick is saying about the sign that we set what the goal language is, we set what the goal language is here more like, and then not engineer the entrances tonight, I guess is what I'm saying. And and then see, the, and the council will have two cracks at this to see, and the, and the applicant would have an idea of how to solve the problem. So I guess that would be like a qualitative condition rather than a trying to redesign. We need a new board, and I have a suggestion. There are 10 uh, conditions by the staff recommendation. And I think we are talking about number one, number four, and then number 11, which is my fire hydrant. <laughs> I have number 11. Yeah. Dick okay. Keeler's fire hydrant. Okay. I have number 11. Now, why don't we just sit here and take a straw vote? How many are in favor of changing one? To allow one line at the toe, two wall signs, similar, same size as half an inch, not to exceed, not to exceed, or leave it like it is. I'm okay with one as as you describe it. Are, are we okay with that? I will support that. Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, we say proportional to recently constructed hotels. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say then, proportional. I would say that for a final. So. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Like we're the the other thing right. too is Hampton Inn from one side is more than 100 feet from the street, so just keep that in mind as well. Okay, so what's your second? Okay. Number four. Okay, possible widening or uh, that can go by itself, but uh, multi-use path, okay, or second entrance. How many are in favor of the second entrance? I don't yes. care. I need an access point. I don't care what it is, as long as the chief's satisfied and it meets. Right. That's my good thing. Second emergency access point. Well, that's that's crazy. Crazy. But that's not what we're saying. Yeah, that's not what we're saying. Okay. The two choices. One is an emergency access, and one is a second entrance. Emergency How many access are on each side. Emergency is more important to me. It, that's well, not that's sufficient not. for me because we could have a multi-access that doesn't meet the needs of the chief as stated previously. So my condition is. The chief signs off on it, <laughs> which gives the option of all these things, right? <laughs> I agree with Mr. Bracken. I'm more concerned with uh, the feasibility. And, and one thing I will say, and I appreciate your comments, the probability of something happening is low, but the impact of something happening is high. So I have a one in a trillion chance of winning Mega Millions, but if I win it, wow, that's a heck of an impact. Okay, so then I just want to make sure I'm correct in interpreting what you said, which is that you would be in favor of a second entrance. No. No, no. We would be in favor of any solution that the chief is okay with safety-wise. So, so no, you do not want a second entrance. No, you do not want a second entrance. No. Nope. No, you do not. Okay. okay. No, you do not. I like
like that's Mr. Morris. Absolutely true. I like Mr. Moore's condition. There you go. <laughs> so there you Mr. Moore, could you read your condition that's again, what he's please? To do. Hold on a sec. Mr. Moore? Yes, could Mr. You read the Chair. Condition? So the condition that I wrote specified that an emergency access point shall be explored, and I would add explore between, I guess, staff and the applicant, and implemented to the greatest degree possible without creating a second vehicular access point for regular traffic. You had approval of the chief, you got, yeah. you got me. And I actually want them to have the option between, of having a second entrance yeah. for, shall we say, yeah. yes. explore between community development staff, the fire chief, and the applicant? Yeah. yeah. But, but I'm not opposed to a second entrance, I just don't need one. Hey, get rid of this explore thing. Yeah. A secondary okay. approach, yeah. emergency access a, a second shall be designed yes. for emergency access point agreeable to the fire chief need to be provided. Period. Lovely. Can I sit there real quick? Go ahead. Yeah, and I agree completely. Low percentage things, yes, they're low percentage, but if they're catastrophic, they're catastrophic. Don't allow for that to the best of your ability. Also, a lot of times when we bring up the percentages of things happening, they're not independent. The same thing that brings people there for a fire could be the thing that actually prevents you from getting that line across. So, so we all agree that we need to have a secondary Sorry, yes. emergency fire access. All right. We do all agree on that. All agree on that. <laughs> to be, you know, and, and to be designed in conjunction with staff and, and the applicant and so, approved by the fire chief. So, so it talks about access. Uh, rather than uh, yeah. So I'm going to rein this back in because we have so much more fun and excitement. Um, so, did you capture that, Mr. Moore? I think so. <laughs> okay. The 11th condition uh, that I agree with Mr. Keebler on is the uh, fire hydrant, the city uh, maintained fire hydrant that he essentially Dick's hydrant. The, the, the applicant shall install a, a fire hydrant for city specification on the north side of the road near the entrance. Not in the solution, that's good. I just totally. I think that also reduces the risk and possibility. I think we need applicant agreement for that. And I've never had a conditional use condition like that, of that level of risk. So why? Well, so here's a question, though. They have to run the fire line. We're just saying it has to be, uh, instead of saying you can run a hose, which could be a garden hose, we're saying you have to run a five foot. I'll guarantee you, if you were in Westchester Township, you'd have a surround on that whole building. Period. So I, we're much too lenient here. Today. Jason, please go ahead. Well, I was just going to say it depends on what's consistent and what's fair. Even though I think it's a great idea, if this is brought up new for the first time and it's a demand that we haven't put on other developers, that's not fair. But also, they might be amenable to it. It might not be an issue. Well, I also think we have had a situation. Uh, all the hotels that have been built, which ha some have been newer than 20 years, are all uh, they're not in an area like this where it's undeveloped. Right. Mm -hmm. So what we are talking about here. But I think it's related, and I think that why it is a level of granularity, but we could be talking about where the driveway should go in order to pre prevent, you know, for fire safety. And I think that if, if a hydrant also enables us, them to do the plan like this, that addresses, mitigates the concern of a hotel. And, a and, and one could argue uh, a hydrant line is cheaper than uh, curb cut and other things. Um, there is one thing, and, and um, I do want to wrap this up, but uh, between Mr. Keebler and Mr. Kropenbaker, there was a really good observation. Uh, I don't think this has to be a condition, but I would really implore staff and the applicant, um, if there is the hope, desire, and expectation that there will be buses, I know with um, certain properties that is an issue, um, I'm simply because it's the easiest one to explain, the Elms doesn't have bus parking in close proximity, so if that was something that could be um, validated because if they are going to have that uh, up there knowing Raceway and, and those areas quite well there's no parking on College Park Pike and I just want to make sure um, this goes back to my seven foot parking garage pickup truck example of four years ago is you know, a visitor to town doesn't know our town so for us to have things that are hard to figure out on the spot that's not really well done. Thank you. 
Well, and I don't think it relies to a level of conditions, but we have encouraged and people have worked out mutual kind of parking arrangements with their neighbors. And then there's a church, the church adjacent. And so just as you have neighbors there are parking, and I think some kind of mutual agreement with them would just be mutually beneficial. But we don't need to make the condition. Yeah, I just, I, he, he had a, they had really good points that I wanted to make sure we captured. So, herding in the cats, any new issues, unresolved issues, or anything that people are going to die tonight about? So I have a motion to approve. I, I will clarify, and we have a second. That is a motion to approve with changes to staff recommendation one. Uh, Mr. Moore, I'm not sure how you worded that, but as I understand it is the monument uh, without a height variation and two building signs not to exceed the size that has been previously approved, for example, at the Hampton Inn, is how I understand condition number one. Um, I believe, did you rewrite number four? Or was that an additional? Well, maybe it's an additional. Maybe it's better as an additional. Is it a better as an additional? Yeah, number four is about the emergency access point. I, you could probably leave number four alone because that talks about yeah. the okay. main entrance. So I will, only because we've referred to it as number 11, I would like to keep number 11, the city hydrant, city spec hydrant, as described by Mr. Kubler at the entrance, right. as number 11, at the vehicle entrance. At the vehicle entrance, and I would like to entertain, and if you could read it into the record, number 12. And number 12 would be the condition that I had read twice already. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the way it's worded right now is an emergency access point shall, well, it says shall be explored between community development staff, the fire chief, and the applicant and implemented to the greatest degree possible without creating a second vehicular access point or curb cut for regular traffic. Uh, yeah, but no, it, do it doesn't sound like that no. matches. Yeah, that's why I wanted you to read it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Many of us want the option of if the developer would like to create a second entrance, I think there's a, probably a majority here that would approve of that. I don't want them to be, I want them to have that. I think at least three or four of us want them to have that option, and Mr. Keebler was emphatic about the word explore, and mm -hmm. it's a little too loosey goosey. So how about a, a secondary emergency fire access be designed in collaboration between... If that's the, inclusive of a normal... Yes. You are trying to eliminate you the second option. You are. No, are we... I'm saying is that... So we're not just a point of order, it is Mr. Keebler's motion, so... <laughs> okay. Uh, no, I'm let, just, let's let him clarify, and if you'd like well, to offer I, him about one number that. twelve to say that the applicant shall provide an emergency access point or a second vehicular entrance uh, as in consultation with in consultation staff. with the fire chief and city staff. Excuse me. So it's one or the other. One or the other. What you've talked about, and just so it's clear to me, I was. One or the other. Yeah. But I now get at it. You're saying one or another. Make that absolutely clear, so at least I know what I'm saying. Yeah. Okay. Is that clear as mud, sir? Actually, I think that came through quite clear. Um, <laughs> so what I just heard is the applicant shall provide a secondary emergency access point or second curb cut in consultation with um, community development staff, the fire chief, and well, I'm sorry, it starts with the applicant, so in consultation with city staff. We'll just call it city staff, which includes yeah. the fire chief. I, I would like to specify, no, no, uh, not, not trying to be flippant, but I do want to say community development staff and uh, fire chief, because city okay. staff could be the person who does payroll. Yeah. And we get him into the solution. Yes. Yeah. All right, so if we, <laughs> Mr. Keebler, it is your motion. Do you, yeah. do you agree with the 12 second? conditions? You do, Mr. Dana, secondary. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I think you did, but I think it was a while ago. Oh, okay. We've discussed so much. Would you like that. to still second? <laughs> yes, I would indeed. Yeah. All right. I want it part of the record as well. <laughs> Perfect. Mr. Perry, please end this. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Prithrich? Yes. Mr. Bracken? Yes. Mr. Dana? Yes. Mr. Keepler? Absolutely. Mr. Rosenberg? Yes. Mr. Watt? 
Yes. And we got lost in the nitty gritty, but thank you for your proposed investment in our community. Looking forward to it. Um, yes, we are very excited about this. This is a high quality development. Uh, so, yeah. I'm kind of messing with the AI right now. That's, that's a I've noticed that. This is why we need AI to do this. All right. Uh, as the chair, I'm going to exercise privilege. We are going to take a five minute recess uh, so that folks can uh, get their wits about them, and we will very quickly add. It's 9.15 according to the actual clock, not that one, so 9.16 according to the broken clock. Right.
since 16 and change. So, at this point, we're going to resume new business with PC 2022 03. The Owl's Landing is a final plan development for 86 single family lots. John Bayer of Bayer Becker and Todd Holmes are the applicants. So, at this time, I will entertain a motion to enter. Excellent, move forward. Second. And with the anticipatory motion and second, we have Mr. Dana and Ms. Rosenberg. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposition? Seeing none, Mr. Moore, you have the floor. All right, thank you, Mr. Watt. This is the last case of the evening. This is a final plan development for the Owls Landing residential community. This is case number PC-2022-03. The applicant is Todd Holmes, LLC. Engineer is Bear Becker. This is under the care of John Bear. <clears throat> the site area involved, so we're talking about a 22 acre site. This is along Brookville Road. This is obviously one you've seen before as a preliminary. Um, site frontage is a little over 1,300 feet along Brookville. Current zoning classification is R1B, single family, medium density, residential. Um, it's already been approved for uh, preliminary plan development, so that is, in a, of course, in effect in a sense. And the proposal uh, is more or less matching to that of preliminary, which is for the 86 single family lots and these will be located on private streets within the site. So here is a look at the site location. So this is west of Mustaf Farms, south of Community Park, and here is Brookville Road right here. Zoning classifications is pretty much all, it's all residential in this area. R1B is a shared classification between Mustaf Farms and the future Owls Landing community. R1A zoning is up to the north for the community park as well as for the Long Meadow subdivision, which is further east and to the north. Okay, so here is the project timeline thus far. So, Planning Commission first saw a concept plan for Owls Landing. This was back in April of last year. So, there wasn't a formal vote on that. I think that was actually our last virtual meeting that we had uh, back in April. And then the preliminary plan development and subdivision. So there were really two distinct items there, approval of the subdivision and approving the plan development, but they were considered more or less as one, one proposal, one bucket. And uh, those were proposed in tandem. Planning Commission made a recommendation that was favorable on those in December of last year. So that has since gone uh, this year in January to council for its first and second readings. So that was approved on January the 18th for the preliminary PD and the subdivision for these proposals. And then uh, the next step in sequence, so there's the construction drawings that have all of the very detailed sort of engineering specs and, and things when it comes to the infrastructure that's going to be going into the development. Um, the stormwater, the streets, the utilities, etc. those are all conveyed in those drawings. That's an administrative review and that happens regardless of whether something's a plan development or not. It, comes as part of the subdivision review. So that was submitted for administrative review in March, so March 28th. And the final PD is what the Planning Commission is reviewing tonight. So these are kind of going together in sequence, um, one being administrative, one being more discretionary. Um, so one ultimately is gonna inform the other. So whatever this final PD ends up being, once it's approved, that will inform sort of the final zoning comments, if you will, on the construction drive. So Planning Commission reviewing the final PD tonight, future council review for that. The final subdivision will just take a council review um, and that has yet to be submitted, but I believe it will be submitted quite soon um, for council to review that as well, possibly in tandem with this final PD. Okay, so here is a look at the site aerial. So the scope of a final PD review is much more limited than would be for preliminary. What we're mainly checking for is to make sure that there, if there were conditions, um, requirements that were specified as part of the preliminary approval, are those conditions or requirements being met? And secondly, does the final plan conform substantially to the preliminary? Those are the two key items that we're looking for here. So it's not a very involved review at this stage, uh, but there are a few differences that I'd like to point out. So uh, this is starting with the preliminary plan. So this is the one that was approved January 18th by council. So that's the layout right there. And then switching to the final plan. So if I go back and forth, you can see pretty much identical. And I did check each, each lot line. Um, they are all identical, except there's like three lots right over here that shifted boundaries just a little bit. But 
we're talking about a nearly identical plan in this case. Sometimes with plan developments, you can get a very conceptual preliminary. The final is a little bit more refined. In this case, there was a very clear vision from the start, and the plans are pretty much almost one and the same for one another, but just a little bit more detail that's being provided now, especially when it comes to the landscaping, which is being shown here at this point. Um, before I move on to the next slide, I just want to mention also we did receive just this week a revision to this very plan that would not be in your packet, but I believe the change is minor enough that we can sort of roll it into the council review or into the council packet, and I'll just explain what that is. So there are these little strips of what would have been HOA land that would fall behind the individual lots along the northern boundary and the western boundary. The intent is to make those lots deep to the point where they're coming. Um, the private ownership is going straight up to the western property line and the northern property line. So the HOA is not going to actually own those tiny little strips in that area. We still will make sure that there's conservation easements that go into place in accordance with the preliminary approval. That will come at the final plat stage because that's when we're checking for easements and things like that. Uh, but I just wanted to make the commission aware of that's a potential change that you're not seeing in your packet right now, but that will um, hopefully ultimately move forward once it, it goes to council, should it go to council. Um, this will in no way diminish the uh, open space, the calculable open space. So those little strips don't technically count toward the open space requirement, which I think was waived a little bit. I think it went from 20% to 14% um, with the preliminary. So eliminating those strips in no way influences in terms of um, compliance from a code standpoint. It's just a better for practicality that the people that own those individual units along those streets will just have the entire depth behind them as their backyard leading up to the adjacent properties, those being the one to the west here and the community park to the north. Um, so I'm going to show you some closer detail as it relates to the landscaping because that was discussed at length at the preliminary stage and the discussions dealt with the buffer that's along Brookville Road which is to contain some mounding and some landscaping, as well as the eastern border with Muscoff Farms. We did hear from some residents of Muscoff Farms that attended the first uh, Planning Commission hearing for the preliminary, and there was a condition put in place that the landscaping plan be revisited so that we're um, hopefully seeing a greater degree of landscaping. I think that's quite the case here based on the plans that have been submitted by the applicant. So this is a closer look at the landscaping along the trail. So. The applicant has since added a number of plantings here. The mounding is in place there. Um, I'd also like to point out, so there's the red dash line that's delineating the future right-of-way line. There's also this green dash line, so that would be a trail easement. So the trail itself, which will be built by the city, again, that's a public project that's part of the OATS system, um, phase four of the OATS uh, trail system. And so that kind of weaves itself back and forth between what would be right of way down here and what would be trail easement up, up here. And so those will be improvements that are done at private expense, but it will be done more or less within the public domain, right? Because it'll be um, nestled up against this public project. So there is a condition that talks about sort of the sequencing of that and sort of waiting for the service department's authorization to go ahead and start the work because we don't want to have it be a situation where some of this work is done and then by nature when that trail comes in all of a sudden work has to be torn back up or redone um, so that's really the reason for that that condition there so this crisscrossing or overlapping if you will between what is ultimately a private project in Owls Landing with the public project which is the trail which of course preceded any of the the discussions or submission of any of this um, any of this residential proposal for Owls Landing. <clears throat> so now I'm going to visit the eastern side of the site, so the buffer area that would exist between the Owls Landing lots and the lots that currently exist along Autumn Drive and Muscoff Farms. So this is a look along the eastern boundary, so there's a number of deciduous and evergreen plantings that are now being shown along there. Um, there's also notes for existing vegetation to remain in this area as well, so uh, we think that uh, the condition that was applied to the preliminary approval is being satisfied with these new landscaping details that have now been provided. Um, and then I'd also like to hit on the 
additional landscaping details that have been provided for the central open space. So almost like a little central park area where um, this trail segment is, that has been planned and shown to be built up to the community park property line. Uh, it's gonna kind of wander its way through the middle of the site here. There will be the open space here. So zooming in on the details there. So there's a number of plantings that are also shown in, in uh, little pockets, little half moon shaped areas. So, so uh, some, some landscape areas. There's the gathering space, which is in the center. And so those plantings around there as well. Um, so staff feels that these details are sufficient as well. Okay. Um, so the recommendation is for approval. Um, not as many conditions with this one. I don't, oh, actually there is 10 conditions. So there's, there's quite a few, uh, I take that back. So I will go through each of these and explain them. So condition number one is a, is a pretty typical condition that we will um, apply to plan development proposals that are also subdivisions because subdivisions take some time to come to fruition. The code normally only allows a one year horizon for a project to be realized, to be built out completely. That is not realistic in this case. So five years is what we've landed on in the past. So we'd like to propose that again for Al's Landing. Um, condition number two it talks about the mounting and landscaping that I mentioned and kind of the sequencing of those different construction elements with respect to the Oats project. Condition number three talks about, so that north-south trail segment that goes through the central park area, the open space area. Um, what the city engineer has requested is that be built in its entirety between the oak segment and the park property line as part of the first phase of the project. Um, if I go back to the plan for just a moment, and uh, I apologize, I didn't call it out very well, but the phase one boundary, which they've identified as block A, that's the terminology that they're going for, so block A and block B. So phase one would be in this area right here that I'm highlighting with my laser. So this trail would extend outside of that first phase boundary um, and up and, and, and go toward the community park site. So the developer, the applicant has agreed to construct that portion of the trail as part of phase one, even though this uh, block B area, the phase two area, none of the other infrastructure will go in at that time. Um, and that's really a, a, a great crucial piece to go in as soon as possible because that's gonna provide a nice vital link that ultimately the city could fulfill and kind of plug the gap here um, uh, to connect into the community park trail system. So we're appreciative of that. So that's what condition number three was all about. Condition number four um, basically is, is talking about easements. So there were a number of details that showed up in some form or another on the final PD that relate to all different kinds of easements, talking about public access easements, utility easements, trail easements, conservation easements. There's a number of purposes. Um, just to keep it cleaner, we would just prefer that all that be dealt with at the final plat stage. So this is just to make sure that there's some clarity here where if there's an easement that happened to be shown on the final PD that contradicted or didn't correspond with what's on the plat, that we're just going to operate off of what's on the plat and that will prevail. Um, and actually, I think the latest plan that has been submitted this week did remove a lot of those extraneous details. So um, I think uh, condition four will suit us well moving forward to the final plat stage. Condition number five is just sort of reminding or reiterating the fact that for a conservation easement, you shouldn't have any construction activity taking place within that easement. So the exact provisions that are tied to that easement will need to be part of the review for the final plot itself. Um, condition number six, so uh, staff and the applicant, we are working through the lighting details at this time uh, to determine the lamp pole locations along the streets, make sure that there's adequate lighting of key areas like crossings of sidewalks, uh, the multi-use path crossings, the cluster mailbox locations, making sure that those key areas that need to be well lit um, are being lit appropriately. So that's what condition six is there for. Condition number seven um, deals with the street infrastructure details being revised as necessary. We are working toward um, getting those necessary details wrapped up as part of the construction drawings. Um, 
So that has to do with the accessibility for emergency vehicles, uh, mainly at the end of the three different stubs that will go to phase two. So um, making sure that if, if phase one, on the off chance if phase one is the only phase that gets built, um, can it stand alone, can it function on its own, and can the turnaround ability for emergency vehicles be guaranteed? So that can be guaranteed in the form of a, a like a, a bulb, sort of a turn, turnaround, temporary turnaround, or like a T turnaround at the end of those steps. So I think that'll be, uh, we'll be able to work through that by being empowered with this condition here, condition seven, and working through those details. Uh, making sure we satisfy our fire chief so we have adequate accessibility for this development. Um, condition number eight, so um, we asked a couple times of the applicant, are you planning any gateway signage, any entryway sort of monument sign or anything like that? At this point, they're not planning anything like that, but um, I figured it would be helpful to go ahead and just for clarity's sake, mention it that if it does come to pass down the line that we would probably want to consider it as an amendment to the plan development. So looking at the sign details, looking at the location and things like that um, would be done on a more discretionary basis. So that's what condition eight is designed to do. Condition number nine is just uh, kind of reminding of the necessary steps that would have to happen once the final, final PD is approved. Um, we'll need approved construction drawings, financial security for the public and private improvements. That's a must for any subdivision. Uh, to make sure that we've got the, the necessary bonding in place. The final plat, of course, will need to be approved by council and ultimately recorded and have all the necessary easements in place. Um, and then the HOA declaration and restrictions, which were included in your packet. I don't believe there's been too many changes, if any, since the original set that you would have seen with the preliminary, uh, but those are under review right now with our law director and with staff to make sure everything is good to go there. And then finally, condition number 10 just um, reiterates that there were a number of conditions that went with the preliminary uh, for ordinance number 3658. And so we want those to remain in full force and effect to the extent that they wouldn't be overwritten or sort of superseded by nature of this particular approval of the final PD. So that is, that concludes all the conditions that I have for the commission. I am happy to take any questions. Any questions for Mr. Moore? Sir, thank you. At this time, if uh, Mr. Thayer or uh, well, I, I'm not sure who's speaking on your behalf. You're always welcome, Mr. Thayer. It's all right. There's no objection. Yeah, just give me a minute. I appreciate that. Uh, John Bayer, uh, Bayer Becker, with uh, at uh, 110 South College Avenue, Oxford, Ohio. Uh, I'm here for any questions you might have, uh, but don't have any. Specific info to add to uh, Zach's presentation. Uh, Todd Hall with uh, Todd Holmes is here as well. Uh, if you have specific questions for him, uh, he may have an item two to add uh, to the discussion. Thanks. Questions for Mr. Mayor or Ms. Bear? I don't see any questions. Yes, <laughs> well, you're welcome to. So come far, up so and, simple, right? Yeah, you're, you're welcome to come up and share your thoughts. Sure. Thank you for that. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. First and foremost, thank you for your commitment tonight, another long night, uh, ensuring that tomorrow's Oxford is a better tomorrow, so thank you. Um, Mr. Moore and Mr. Perry have been amazing to work with. It's been a long ride, but it's been a great ride. They protect the details of the city, and I want to make sure that you know that from me standing here, that the, de the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed with your staff. Um, just so you know, the trail easement has been deeded to the city of Oxford. Uh, you now own that piece of property uh, for the Oaks Trail extension. Uh, I gave you my word at the last meeting. I honor my word. I just wanted to reassure you that you have it now. Um, just to touch real quick, I'll make this real short and simple. Um, I went under contract on this property 17 months ago. And by the time I'm able to put a blade in the ground, it'll be between 23 and 25 months. And that has been a struggle for me. In my business, time is money, unfortunately. And I just wanted to let you know that I am here if the members 
or any of the employees want to have conversations about is there any way that still protects the city and can be a little bit more uh, faster on the timeline for private businesses like myself. I'm just a small business. I'm not a big business. Uh, this was a, a, a project that I've already purchased. Um, and you know, Lord, Lord forbid if I would have had to obtain outside financing, I don't believe that I could have got a loan to buy this property from a financial institute like a bank without having zoning. Um, so I don't think this project would have been possible for me if I wasn't able to just go ahead and buy the farm. Uh, but I bought it, bought, bought it in good faith and I was able to, so I'm able to stand here today. But I did want to let you know that where I'm sitting, it, it does create a, a little uh, different scenario than I'm used to. So I'm always open for conversation with that. Um, and I just have one more thing um, real quick. Um, is there any way that this property can have the opportunity to have a secondary emergency access point just like the last one? <laughs> since <laughs> since it meets the exact same qualifications. The fire chief likes that one. <laughs> he knew it was coming. <laughs> While that discussion was going, I believe he knew it was coming. But in all due fairness, it's the same amount of density. It's the, it, it has the trail on it. I don't see uh, financially why this project would take the burden of a full curb cut if the, the same thing could be done at a different property. I, I don't see the difference. If there is a difference, I respectfully would, would entertain it, but I, I just don't get it. And I, I would be a bad businessman if I didn't stand here and, and at least say that or ask for that, but it's not, you know, it is what it is at this point, but I, I think it's only fair to myself that I, that I do voice my opinion on that. And I appreciate you, what, pardon me. I'm sorry? Did you, the last thing you said. Uh, just to voice my opinion, I, that's oh, yeah. my responsibility okay. as a small business. I saw the opportunity that is the exact same, in my opinion, from everything I heard tonight. And I just wanted the opportunity to, to at least express how I felt about it and see if there's an opportunity to have the same option to have a secondary emergency access point explored. No, we, I think the biggest difference is commercial versus residential. No, I agree with you. I but would I, have a main second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and I, in all due fairness, I, I agree with the, the commercial and the residential, and I think that there's actually more burden on the commercial than the residential, in my opinion. But the, I, that's just my opinion. That's all I got. I hope you have a wonderful night, and thank you thank very you. much. All right. Thank you, sir. We can get a check-in and check-out time for residents. I think we're on the same page. All right. I will, uh, I will entertain any uh, comments from the public. At this point on this uh, business item, Mr. Kruppenbaker? Just one more time. Seth Kruppenbaker again. Uh, this is the same name. Uh, I think, um, you know, just broadly, uh, this development represents a, a category of, of high need, both presently and moving forward as it relates to residential development throughout the city of Oxford. And it's been touched on a number of times, but kind of the full scope of the impact of the Oats Trail easement, uh, it really kept us on track and, and being able to develop uh, phase four, keep us in line with uh, grant funding and moving forward for the kind of full development of the Oaks. So really this, this project uh, allowed for um, that, that development of that trail, um, which you know has a number of um, equity uh, and economic impacts on our community. So um, certainly appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. If you would uh, state your name and your address, sure. we'd certainly appreciate it. Mike Laser, I live at 6678 Brookville Road, which would be to the property just to the west of this in the township. Um, I've submitted comments before for the initial uh, hearing and uh, I'd like to make some comments today. Um, first one is the financial viability of this project. Since the beginning of this year, mortgage rates have gone up 66%. Uh, Building materials have gone up by 20% in the last year. None of this seems like it's going to stop anytime soon. Obviously, owning the property next door, my family's chief concern is if this gets halfway done and they run out of money, I've got uh, 
basically a construction zone sitting next to my property from here on out. Um, so it's uh, when you have downturns like you do today, and I saw this when I was living in San Diego in 91, where people just walked away from construction projects as the housing market collapsed. And I would be uh, extremely afraid of what would happen here. Uh, next one's a minor point, the trail. Uh, the diagram for some reason still shows the trail continuing uh, to the west of the property. I don't think uh, that's happening anymore. Um, so just so everybody's clear on that. And then finally, the biggest one is infrastructure. Uh, Brookville Road along this section is 55 miles per hour. If anybody was out there by the park last week or last two weeks while the uh, soccer tournament was going on, you can see how bad things get backed up now and how fast people come down that road. And now you're going to put 88 more houses out there without basically building up the road at all. Uh, it's, it's going to turn into a nightmare. In addition, uh, the vegetation and the things that you're looking to put along Brookville Road are going to decrease those sight lines. How far anybody can see up or down that road there. Now in the morning when the folks are coming from in from Indiana at 55, 60 miles an hour, you're just asking for a lot of accidents to happen and none of them are going to be good. Um, so those are our concerns and uh, I thank you for the opportunity uh, to bring them forward. Can I tell you who did that in there? The city well, attempted to yeah. get this, the speed limit reduced in that area. But the problem is when, um, when the township road, the county road, the county engineer sets the speed limit. And, 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 I he, would, and he wouldn't reduce right. it. Right. And I, I think understand. this is going to allow it to get reduced. Okay. Well, but until it does, you're looking at a lot of issues. All right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any other comments from members of the public? All right. Seeing none, I'll accept the motion. Close, to close. Move to close public hearing. <laughs> I'll accept the motion to close public hearing. Second. Do I have a second before the first? Um, all right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition? Seeing none. All right. Discussion. Ms. Cleveland. I move to approve. Second. <laughs> Include the conditions as shown. Uh, I'd like to make a friendly amendment to, I believe it was condition A. Let me get back to that. Which one? I believe it's condition A. So. I'm not saying that, but part of what I'm saying is we did have extensive, extensive discussions on the signage of the road. So, but I think city staff can handle it. All right, well, that's my friendly amendment. Mm -hmm. And I think I, <laughs> is it my motion? <laughs> or who moved? You moved. Okay. You moved. Oh, that's right. Public. Yeah, I moved to close public hearing. Yeah, I moved to close public I just wanted to go ahead and see if I, I list it. Starts up as a pro proposed construction of the road, complete elimination of existing obstruction. Okay. Toward, toward the end, it says, though much of the impact has now been determined and subsequently approved as a result of the first preliminary convening subdivision review, there are still some outstanding considerations with respect to the conservation easement to be put in place along the northern and western boundaries of the site. I'm just trying to figure out in my mind what some of these outstanding considerations are or whether we have already discussed them and addressed them. So, just a point of order. We have a motion and a second. I've made an amendment. Before we get to any discussion or any, any 
before this stuff, it's a full moon in um, in Aries. So the paradox we have here is Mr. Dana has questions on the decision criteria, which would uh, preclude our usual um, uh, unless there's any objections. So because the decision criteria have to be addressed and fulfilled, he just asked a question. I know. phrase some outstanding considerations I heard the panel say well what considerations are they talking about that have to be that have to be addressed uh, you put in place a long moon order and that can have a, a sorry we used to have to address the negotiate the final final approval of the yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe that answers the question can you answer it yeah I can speak to that so um, I think I hinted at this a little bit in my presentation so one of the requirements, one of the conditions for the preliminary talked about conservation restrictions along the northern property boundary and western property boundary. Yes. Um, we did get some details. <clears throat> I think there were some labels that were applied to the original final PD plan that was submitted um, indicating uh, conservation easements and I think it was only noted along the northern boundary but um, I think the condition about the easements being it, we're more or less kicking the can a little bit. We're kicking it to the final subdivision because that's when it's most appropriate to um, observe those boundaries, the resulting boundaries for the northern and western property lines, as well as the conservation restrictions that are tied to those boundaries. So in other words, what are the provisions exactly as far as what you can and cannot do in those easements? Um, what can you do, if anything, to the vegetation that may be within those easements? So those are the types of considerations that I think would be best suited for the final subdivision review that's reviewing the plat as opposed to the stage that we're at right now. That completely satisfied me. I think we sought an answer. Thank you very much. That's it. Done. Can you put in order? Are we having a discussion or are we voting? Because normally we have discussion then we make a motion. But we, well, we can do it either. I mean, we, we can do it either way. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm kind of making my point. <laughs> we normally have a discussion, so I would, I would respectfully request that the and the second are withdrawn so that we can go to the status quo and have a discussion because technically it looks like it may be after the vote. I don't think that really hurts Robert. I really think that Robert should have to privilege of the chair. before you can discuss it. Privilege of the chair, historical application. <laughs> so, do you, you want to no. have a discussion? Let's have a discussion. No, I understand that. I asked a question. It was answered, and I said I'm through. I don't. That wasn't an idea. I was just saying, if we're going to have a discussion, let's have a discussion. And we'll pause the motion in a second. Nope. Okay. That's fine. All right, so we have a motion in a second. So, as I understand it, it would be to accept staff recommendations as presented and with the agreement that all 14 decision criteria are met without objection from anyone on the commission. Mr. Perry, would you call the roll? Mr. Dana? Yes. Dr. Perthrich? Yes. Mr. Bracken? Yes. Mr. Keebler? Yes. Ms. Rosenberg? Yes. Mr. Watt? Yes. All right. And before anyone jumps the gun on a motion to adjourn, we have something for Mr. Keebler. I just want to say that uh, this will be my last planning commission meeting. My term expires uh, the end of June. We're going to be a, on a family vacation at your next meeting, so I won't be here. Um, I think I've done my part. Yeah. Yeah, 34 years on the fire department, eight years on city council, of which four I was mayor, and a total of 10 years on the planning commission. So I'm going to take a step back and say it's time for somebody else to step up. I will miss it. I've enjoyed it. I hope it is a better place because of what I've taken part in. We've had our disagreements over the time, but everything in the end has been friends, and I appreciate that. So, thank you.
but you have done some rare things that other people might not have, but you have, so we appreciate it. Ah, yes. Well, and, and since I spent many, many, many a Tuesday night, sometimes <laughs> arguing with Dick, it, no one has ever brought more of their A-game to a meeting than Dick in terms of attention to detail. Um, he's not afraid to, to, to say no to things or to put his foot down. And I've all found that even when there's, uh, um, I don't want to even call it per disagreement, it's in the end the city's better because of diversity of opinion we argue about stuff and we arrive at a better compromise solution. So it's hard to imagine a planning commission without Dick Keebler, yeah. but the city uh, has received more than its service from you, so it's been an honor. Thank Congratulations. <laughs>